Good evening. This is the May 17th, 2018 of the North Ham City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the City Council President. I'll be presiding tonight. Let me announce the audio and video recording of these proceedings. And we will begin this meeting, as we always do, with a period of public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. There are only two rules. First, please keep your comments to three minutes. And second, remember that this is your time and we're prohibited by, uh, from engaging in a back and forth with you. But you can always follow up with individual counselors about concerns you might have after the meeting. So I'll start with our sign-up sheet and then I'll open it up to anyone else who would like to speak. And the first is Edgardo Cancel. And feel free to take the podium and if you give your name and address for the record. Hello, everyone. My name is Edgardo Cancel. I uh, reside at 19D Hampshire Heights. I grew up here in uh, Northampton. Um, and I am the father of a very cool 14-year-old and a very cool 22-year-old. Um, and uh, that's precisely why I'm here. It's because um, ever since I was a youth, I've always been a, an advocate of youth, um, and of youth work. I've worked with and alongside um, young people. Um, and one of my biggest uh, reasons for advocating is um, uh, to make sure that uh, our young voices are heard. Um, and so when I saw on TV um, what our youth commission, uh, the resolution uh, they're working on, um, and how um, supportive our city is of, um, of passing a re resolution that would lower the voting age in municipal elections to 16 years old. Um, it's really amazing. Um, and it really uh, helps me to guide my son um, because in our relationship, uh, I, I, we, I pretty much see it as he helps me as much as I help him. Um, and that's also been my experience in working in the different youth organizations that I, that I work um, at. And I'm almost done here with the time that I have allowed. Um, You're plenty of time. Oh, is it just, is it two? You forgot to start it, so you have <laughs> bonus time. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, I'm like, oh, I didn't even get to the juicy part. Um, so, um, <laughs> So that's, that's part of the reason that I'm here is because my son, um, besides being a member of uh, an organization that I'm a leader at uh, for the last 12 years, uh, the name is the Julius Ford Harriet Tubman Healthy Living Community. And uh, what our organization does is uh, we have a conference up at Earth Dance in uh, Plainfield every year. We gather youth from different youth organizations in the area. We go there for a week and we um, have an intergenerational community uh, where we all have equal parts in, um, in what, how, uh, what we do is determined. Uh, in fact, last year, um, our youth not only planned but facilitated the entire week. Um, and my son was part of, um, of that, um, um, of those leaders. And so uh, he was also part of the Re-Energizing Democracy um, initiative um, that um, started a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know if some of you have heard of it, uh, but it's an effort by, um, by the city um, to try and um, bring information uh, from traditionally marginalized communities about how come some people don't get involved in the civic process, how come um, uh, folks um, don't uh, intermingle in, um, in a lot of the decision-making um, uh, processes that we have here. And so, one of the things um, that we often talked about was the need for our youth uh, to, to have a, uh, more of a presence and voice. Uh, however, what, I'm, uh, what my son has been experiencing lately in my work in our own community at Hampshire Heights, um, I'm the president of the tenant association there that, that's formed uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and we have, we've had many difficulties in being able to succeed in doing programming, doing different things to help the community out because we've been having clashes with the Northampton Housing Authority. So I'm here because I've gone through the proper channels. I've spoken to the director. I've gone to their commissioner, board of commissioners um, meetings several times, and I've expressed my concerns. Uh, but instead, what I feel has happened is that I've been um, personally targeted and attacked for um, the work that I've been doing and for calling out the things that aren't right. Um, and so uh, I'm here uh, to say that 
um, uh, as, 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 a fa as a concerned father, I want my son to be feeling safe that we're not gonna get evicted because we're build, trying to build our communities and, um, and being leaders in our community. And that's exactly what has happened. Um, so, I mean, I can go on and on, but basically my concern is that um, uh, I need some help uh, from other folks uh, that can perhaps guide us in how to get things done in our community Thank at you. Hampshire Heights. Thank you very much, and we'll follow up on that. Um, the next person signed up is Heather Warner, please. Hi, thank you. My name is Heather Warner. I live at 115 Pine Street in Florence. Um, and I'm here to talk about the um, cap on marijuana um, retail shops. And I want to thank Dennis Bidwell and Jim Nash for sponsoring this and um, for listening to <coughs> myself and some of my colleagues and residents um, at the Legislative Matters Committee. Um, because <coughs> adult use of, of recreational marijuana is completely new, um, it's really prudent for leaders in Northampton to assert a robust local control and regulation as we um, see what this market-driven industry may bring, both positive or negative, to our community. Um, this includes capping the number of retail marijuana stores that want to open in our community. In Hampshire County, 5% um, of 8th graders, 24% um, of 10th graders, and 40% of 12th graders use marijuana regularly in the past 30 days, that is. And that's of a countywide study of over 3,000 students. Um, and that's every 8th, 10th, and 12th grader in Northampton that was there at school that day. Um, so marijuana and alcohol are not an ordinary commodity. They're a controlled substance and have serious public health and safety implications and therefore warrant thoughtful and effective uh, regulation to uh, really curb excessive adult use and youth access and exposure. So a cap on the number of marijuana establishments is good business, and it's also good for public health. A cap will deter a glut of marijuana retailers in a highly competitive marketplace. For most products, competition is healthy, but for controlled substances, there are negative outcomes. It can cause product prices to tank. With alcohol, there are protections against selling products below wholesale and other measures like the three-tier system that keep pricing stable and not tanking. Um, but there's no such law for marijuana. Excessively low prices increase adult use and through social access sources also therefore lowers the price and increases use among youth, a demographic that's particularly sensitive to pricing. So fierce competition for customers can also lead to sloppy business practices, including how well someone checks ID and um, how attentive clerks are to fake IDs. Um, the Massachusetts Package Store Association opposes lifting caps on alcohol for these reasons. So a finite number of retail establishments also allows businesses to plan accordingly. We know it takes a lot of time to plan for these. And um, if they think there's endless caps in Northampton, I feel like it presents the idea that there's endless opportunity when in fact we may feel there's a need to cap at 10, at, uh, not less. Um, heavy competition is also not favorable to small business model. Um, in Colorado and California, marijuana giants, and this is a quote, seem more than willing to throw their weight around to get a big chunk of the market. Oh, goodness. Do you finish your thought? Okay, so there's a lot of reasons for putting a cap on. I think, like for me personally, um, I think just the, um, the climate of this community, the, the, the way that we want to raise families here um, really le leads itself to not having it be a pot mecca. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, next is Kip Armstrong, please. Good evening. Um, I'm also here to support the CAPS proposal. Um, I just, I'm going to wing it, but uh, I am um, supporting this for two main purposes. One is the youth. I'm an um, addictions therapist in town as well as general psychotherapy, as well as I sit on the steering committee of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Um, in terms of youth um, and the town in general, I feel like this is a situation <coughs> where we need to be thoughtful and take things slow. There's no need to rush in to this situation. Um, 
there have been a lot of messages that we've received from other states that have gone about this that haven't been so positive. <clears throat> I understand that this is a town that's under a lot of pressure, both because of our voter base, the constituents want overwhelmingly to have marijuana legalized and to have the recreational, but this is a different um, group of people than donut eaters. Um, this is a whole culture and it can take um, and, and have a big impact on the, the um, the look of our town. I spent 16 years <clears throat> touring with the Grateful Dead, and there were a lot of lessons to be learned from that, and one of the things that I've kind of learned is that I don't really want to walk out of my office into sort of a Grateful Dead parking lot scene on a daily basis, and it could happen. There's a lot of social pressures on the town potentially right now because of over-embracing or quickly embracing the potential to make some money and have this um, sort of begin to fill up some empty storefronts or whatever it is versus also we have the casino coming in 20 miles south of us and there couldn't be a lot of social pressure and that's going to have possibly an impact on our community. I think we need to be thoughtful. We're all parents or most of us. We need to take it easy, watch what happens, slowly approach this and sort of adapt as we go. None, as you see in the Boston Globe today, almost no communities are moving quickly with this in the state. If we're the only one that's all set up and ready to go, there's going to be a lot of people coming here. So just sit back, take it easy. Ten shops is a lot. Let's see what happens. Move slowly. See how we can work with this. But this doesn't mean to put a stop on what our community clearly wants. You know, there are ways to do this in a positive way so that everybody wins, because it could be a really great thing. It's, I mean, people have been dreaming about this for years. So just being thoughtful, not rushing in, being careful, seeing how the money works. Where does it go? What can you do with it? How does it happen? It's, but also the culture that comes in with it. And I think that everybody understands what I'm saying. That's important to be thinking about. What is our city going to become? We're on a sort of, you know, verge of sort of a precipice. So. I'm just encouraging you to be thoughtful past this. Let's go slow. You can always reverse it down the road. And, okay, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All your efforts. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who'd like to give public comment? Please. Uh, my name is Blair Gemma, and I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, I also don't want to walk into a Grateful Dead parking lot for different reasons. But um, I wanted to comment on the fact that the council voted in favor of um, teenage municipal voting. And um, just to keep that into account, um, compared to two councilors who felt that it might be proper to create a two-tier wage system for teenagers, um, I think the two are in conflict with each other. Um, and I've done a lot of research at the Labor Center at UMass about um, teenage wages. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind. And I'd just like to bring up again um, uh, that uh, I support uh, Elisa Klein and Maureen Carney's uh, statement this week about the Mayor's Panhandling Work Group. Um, and I'd like to put pressure on councilors um, and on Councilor Dennis Bidwell, who's in the group, and Mayor Narkowitz um, to, to stop uh, the group from functioning. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think I saw Ms. Loisel was next. Hi, my name is Laurie Loisel. I live at 46 Grant Avenue. I'll be quick. Um, just wanted to say that I was at the Legislative Matters meeting this week, and one of the counselors said there are no regulations for other businesses, and that's not true. <laughs> we do regulate alcohol. We regulate cigarettes. Marijuana is is harmful to young people um, and I, I don't see why we need an unlimited number um, of marijuana retail shops. I think people voted to legalize it in this community and other communities for a lot of reasons. Um, we've slowly been decriminalizing it and that's a good thing. I'm not opposed to um, marijuana for adults, but I think it's harmful to the developing brain and for, for adolescents. And I just don't think we need, um, I, I think that people who voted for it did not think there would be an unlimited number in our city. So that's my main thing. 
I think that limiting the number doesn't mean you're going against the will of the voters. Um, I went to a Ward 3 Neighborhood Association meeting a few months, like last winter, I think it was, and when people heard that, that the city was thinking about having no limit, they just couldn't believe it. They just did not know that that was sort of in the cards. And I do think we regulate many other, um, uh, I guess, things that are harmful. And I think we should really think about this. And um, so I hope that you vote for a cap. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, would anyone else like to have public comment? No? If not, we will <coughs> convene and I ask uh, the role of the council to be <coughs> Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor LaBarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. <coughs> Councilor Shara. Yes. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> we are convened. Uh, I'll first uh, announce a public hearings by order of the City Council in accordance with Section 7-4 of the Charter of the City of Northampton. The City Council will hold a public hearing to consider the proposed FY19 budget uh, commencing on Wednesday, June 6, 2018 at 530 in the community room at JFK Middle School. Uh, that is 100 Bridge Road in Florence and continuing on Thursday, June 7th at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers here at 210 Main Street, the City Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard um, thereon. The proposed budget will be available for inspection by the public in the following locations at the specified times. Online on the City of Northampton website at www.northamptonma.gov, Forbes Library, uh, 20 West Street, um, Monday, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Tuesday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., Wednesday, 9 p.m., 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., Thursday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., Lilly Library, 19 Meadow Street in Florence, Mondays, 10 to 5, Tuesdays, 10 to 8, Wednesdays closed, Thursday, 10 to 8, Friday, 10 to 3, Saturday, 10 to 5, Sunday, 1 to 5, and finally, the city clerk's office at 210 Main Street, and the hours of that office are Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. So what will happen is we'll gather at JFK, <coughs> we'll hear from various departments, um, and those will be the Department of Public Works, Central Services, Fire Rescue, the Northampton Police Department, and the schools, and the mayor, and, and, uh, the mayor will be there as well. And then we'll hold it open to the following day, which is a council meeting, so anyone who couldn't make it to the first day will have the opportunity to provide public comment on the second day, and that is the, the, on Thursday the 7th. Okay, uh, that is my update. I have no others. Are there any updates or announcements from members of the council? Councilor LaBarge. Yes, um, I just want to thank all the residents who attended the open public forum on May 14th at Ryan Road School on the proposed development of harvesting cannabis. It was sponsored by me as a city councilor, Just Healthy LLC, and the City of Northampton Planning and, and Sustainability, Wayne Fiden. Very, very well attended. And everything was put in place, and people were able to take their time and ask their questions and get the answers. And I was very pleased how well organized it was. Thank you. Council from Ward 4. I want to announce that this Sunday is Whole Children's Wild Goose Chase. If you're not familiar with Whole Children, it's a wonderful local organization that um, does uh, programming and research, has resources for um, children and young adults with disabilities, and they are an inclusive organization, so um, all children are welcome to attend um, their programs. And so the Wild Goose Chase is their annual 5K uh, walk, carnival, um, and they have kids races. It's a fantastic event. It is also incredibly, uh, it's open to everyone and completely inclusive. Um, you can run a, a chip 5K, you can do the walk, you can um, roll if you're in a wheelchair. Everyone is welcome and there will be events for everyone. There's a great carnival, five food trucks, 
Um, there's a DJ and glitter tattoos, face painting, um, A to Z is bringing stomp rockets and yo-yos, tons of carnival games, uh, Dimension 5 food trucks, and um, so that is this Sunday, May 20th at Look Park, starting at 10 a.m. to 1.30. You can register online at wholechildren.org till 5 p.m. tomorrow, and then you can register at the event before 10 a.m. on Sunday. So please come out and join us. Excellent, thank you. Any other announcements from counselors? Um, unless there's any objection, I'd like to uh, move the presentation from our guests up front because they've made a special trip here. Um, we have a presentation from the Northampton's Veterans Council about Memorial Day Parade in Florence. I'm not sure who will start off, but yes, sir. Mr. Pease, please. The floor is yours. My name is Tom Pease. I live at 130 Spring Street in Florence, and I am the commander at the uh, VFW Post 006. And I'm Steve Connor. I'm the director of Central Hampshire Veterans Services, and I'm supporting what he's doing. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, this year, May the 28th, 2018, marks the 150th Memorial Day Parade, the most, the continuously run parade, the only continuously run parade in the country on Memorial Day. Um, we are quite proud and it's been a lot of work. We have approximately 30 people behind the scenes putting this parade together. But it's not just about the parade. There's also a ceremony that will be taking place on Memorial Day at the Park Street Cemetery. That's the first part of the, uh, it's the solemn ceremony where we're going to read the names of all the fallen for the, from the past year, all the fallen veterans. The mayor will be there. He'll be reading a proclamation. And that part of the day is the remembrance. We're calling it a remembrance of 150 years that the village of Florence, along with the city of Northampton, have continuously had the parade on Memorial Day, rain or shine. And I think there's some people that can attest that a few years ago, it almost didn't, didn't, uh, didn't go off. But the uh, color guard and the police department went out there with a parade permit, and they got it done. Uh, so that starts at 10 o'clock in the morning at the Park Street Cemetery. The ceremony will take approximately 45 minutes. We'll have a rifle salute. Uh, we'll be laying of the laying of the wreath at the uh, memorial, and Girl we Scout will. Flowers. What's that? Girl Scouts in the. The Girl Scouts will be laying the flowers down around the cemetery. It's the, it, it's basically the same ceremony that we've had for years, but we're just going to cut it down a little bit because we have so many other things planned. Um, after that ceremony, at 1 o'clock, the parade will be stepping off. That part of the day we're going to call the celebration. One half is remembrance, of course, and the other part is the uh, celebration that, again, Florence, Northampton have come together for 150 years. Uh, the parade starts at 1 o'clock. It uh, steps off from Smith Vocational High School, <coughs> proceeds through the center of Florence, and we'll go down Park Street and end at the Elks Lodge on Spring Street. Uh, at, we're hoping at 3 o'clock. At 3 o'clock, we're going to have the National Moment of Silence. So all parade participants, if you're going to be there, be aware that we're going to ask you at 3 o'clock whether you are still marching in the parade or you're back at the Elks waiting for everybody else to finish that everybody's just going to stop for one moment for a national moment of silence. That'll be the, our other somber moment and of the day. That's done nationally, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, again, it starts at 1 o'clock. Um, we have approximately, we have 12 marching bands, 30 marching units, 50 or so other groups are going to be in a parade. I have I got 30 or 40 antique cars. Uh, 13 floats or 11 13, floats. Yeah, 13 floats, 11 floats. Like I said, there's about 30 people behind the scenes that have been meeting every Monday night at the VFW putting this together since last August. Uh, so it plans on being a big thing. Another uh, question that's been asked a lot is, will there be any military aircraft? It took a while to do it, but yes, we'll have a pair of two F-15 Eagles will be flying at 1.30 in the afternoon. They will do the flyover. We've been informed that it's at 1.30. Um, so we will be, of course, into the parade. The parade route is 1.6 miles long. 
The parade itself right now is over two miles long. In other words, judging between the floats and the marching bands and all the units. So it's, it's becoming quite a deal. We also have United States Army National Guard Band with 40 members are coming in from the Boston area. We have, uh, let's see, the Silver Dolphin Drill Team coming in from Groton, Connecticut. Uh, local bands, of course, our own Northampton High School Band, Hopkins Academy, East, East Hampton, West, West Springfield. Springfield. So it's become more than a community thing. We've got a lot of people, you know, reaching out to us. <coughs> they, they want to be part of this. I mean, we, uh, I never thought it'd be this big, but it's gotten, gotten quite big. The parade will proceed to, like you said, the Elks. We have people down there directing the traffic and all. Um, there will be a ceremony there. And that is, it will take approximately, it's going to start at 3.15. It's probably going to take about 45 minutes, we hope. But uh, the mayor, of course, will be there. Uh, who is, uh, let's see, we have General Keith. Who else do we have? So we have, um, they're speaking, the mayor will do the welcoming. Um, we will have Congressman McGovern is going to say some uh, remarks. Stan Rosenberg um, has agreed to go ahead and read the proclamation he uh, constructed while he was still uh, Senate, the senator at the State House. So he will be there reading that. It will be followed by um, General Gary Keefe, <coughs> who is the tag for the state of Massachusetts, or otherwise the Adjutant General. And he will be speaking. We will have uh, a couple other quick ceremonial stuff happening, and then we will conclude. Uh, just as a note, the general, his father the general, his brother the general, his uncle the master sergeant are all going to be in our parade. They're yeah. going to be honored people within our parade. So. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and we have Gold Star Mothers to be drawn. Uh, with we'll the, right. some uh, horse-drawn carriages. Yeah, and Tracy Taylor, who right had lived in Tracy Taylor, who lived in Florence for quite a number of years, is a Gold Star mother. Her son, which I'm still wearing since whenever, um, is going to be there, and she's going to make remarks as well on that after mm -hmm. the parade. Um, for any of the people that want to watch the parade there's going to be plenty of parking there's parking lots all alongside behind the Florence Bank uh, yeah, and Goggins. Goggins and uh, so a lot of the side streets you're going to be able to park and I know there won't be any towing right Mayor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, for um, all the participants of the parade when we were, were guessing somewhere between 1200 and 1500 people marching in a parade uh, the VFW in Florence will be providing snacks and beverages prior to stepping off because we've got a lot of youth coming in. As a matter of fact, I have 100 cadets coming from Central High School. It's the Junior ROTC Air Force Edition. There's 100 of them coming up in buses, and they, they couldn't wait to get up here. They have marching units and a drum corps and flag corps, so it, 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 it's become quite a deal. But uh, we're going to feed them some snacks. We're going to give them, make sure they have beverages prior to the parade. And then after, <coughs> all the participants are welcome to come uh, to, after the elk ceremony. They're going to be providing hamburgers, hot dogs, salads, and all that. We're going to make sure that everyone in the parade who participated in the parade is taken care of. OK? Yep. And that's in cooperation with the Elks Club. That's right. That's, uh, yep. The, the Elks Club, the VFW. Yep. We're supplying the food. they got the manpower. Um, but it's, it's been a, a great <coughs> bigger deal than I ever thought it would be. It's, it's, it's such an outpouring of the community. Just it's uh, sometimes at the meetings it's hard to get a word in edgewise because there's so much enthusiasm going on. But uh, it's all falling together and everything looks good. And of course, it's rain or shine. Yes, rain or shine for sure. Um, I, I can testify that it always happens because I remember I was a I don't even think I was a teenager, maybe I was a tween. But to hang out with my father, I had to go to all the parades. And one morning, we're at the VFW early getting ready for the parade, and it was <laughs> raining, and it was about 55 degrees, if not colder. And I guess the mayor back then, it wasn't you way back then, I don't even think you were born back then, I don't know. Um, 
they uh, called up and said, I think we need to cancel the parade. <laughs> well, you never heard a reaction about how that went over. So the members of the VFW, American Legion, and the World War II Club went ahead, got dressed, and marched down uh, Main Street and North Main Street. And I walked alongside with sleet or hail or something hitting me in the side of the face. So I can testify, we always march. So we're going to march this year no matter what. So there might be just 20 participants, or there might be 1,200. We'll see. Um, but let's pray for great weather. And I hope you all can make it. It'll be a great event. And all the news and television outlets have been notified by uh, John Paradis, who takes care of all of that for us. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how, what kind of coverage we get. But we also have it, it is going to be re Yeah, it's going to be recorded from Northampton Community Television and shown later. And you'll be able to download recordings and mm -hmm. help us going forward. OK. Well, thank, I, if I may, sure. I'd like to Thank you for taking the time to come and provide that very comprehensive update about what sounds like, you know, an extremely impressive event and on a very auspicious occasion uh, in the history of our city. You're, and you're going to be there, right? You're I'll be there. Okay. I, I, I think I, could, I couldn't get away with not being there. So <laughs> I look forward to it. I know, I know the whole we city do does. And everyone thank you being for there and honor all of your consist yeah. constituents, friends, neighbors, and. <laughs> I think there are other About people who want to work. Thank you as well, and it's starting right now. So, shirts? Councilor yep. we have We have shirts. I think if you contact the. I already bought four, but you should <laughs> tell. <laughs> Mr. Connors here will we'll gladly you. take your orders. Yeah, if, if you want a shirt, uh, you can call the office. We have them. Um, there'll be even more, and I think. I think we're deal, still doing a different design yeah. um, that will also be available. But you can contact our office, 413-587-1299. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again. All right. <clears throat> um, we will now go back to where we were. And communications and proclamations for the mayor. Mr. Mayor. Good evening, counselors. Um, my primary uh, communication this evening is um, to deliver the uh, budget message to the city council per the city charter. Um, I did uh, deliver to the city clerk earlier today and have provided you copies of the um, my proposed FY uh, 2019 fiscal year budget. And so I will now <coughs> read to you the budget message contained therein. Um, to the honorable members of the city council, I submit for your consideration and approval my proposed $111,976,953 fiscal year 2019 budget for the City of Northampton in accordance with Article 7, Section 7-3 of our Charter. The budget is comprised of a $96,019,032 general fund together with four enterprise fund budgets for water, $7,040,600, sewer, $6,325,939, solid waste, $639,396, and stormwater and flood control, $1,951,986. This total operating budget of $111,976,953 for FY 2019 represents a 2.3% increase over the current FY 2018 City of Northampton budget expiring on June 30th, 2018. This budget also marks a key turning point in our city's multi-year fiscal stability plan implemented with taxpayer support five years ago. That plan, created in conjunction with a $2.5 million general override approved by Northampton voters on June 25th, 2013, used a portion of new property tax revenues to maintain city and school services while stockpiling the remainder in a restricted fund to be used only for stabilizing our finances as needed in future years. We have adhered closely to the plan as promised, updated its revenue and expenditure forecasts annually based on multi-year averages, and have not touched any of the additional override revenues, instead building them up to over $2.9 million. 
prudent financial management and strong economic growth have extended what was originally projected as a four-year plan lasting from FY 2014 through FY 2017 into a seven-year plan capable of sustaining city and school services through FY 2020. One important and unavoidable aspect of our fiscal stability plan was its built-in acknowledgement that without a change in the structural imbalance between annual increases to our city's fixed costs versus a lack of comparable increases in local or state revenue, we would inevitably need to tap into and eventually exhaust the built-up override revenue we stockpiled as part of the plan. That day has now come as we build a budget that maintains our high quality city and school services for another fiscal year. As outlined in the updated version of the multi-year fiscal stability plan that follows this message, the FY 2019 general fund will utilize $277,850 from the fiscal stability stabilization fund. This will mark the first time we have accessed these funds in accordance with our plan. While I do not take this step lightly, it is important to note that the original plan I presented to the taxpayers five years ago to stave off deep cuts to city and school services in the FY 2014 budget had projected we would need to begin drawing from our override reserves in FY 2017. The single largest expenditure in the proposed budget is our appropriation to the Northampton Public Schools, which will increase by $865,169 to $29,704,135, or 3%. The school budget proposed by Superintendent Provost and approved by the Northampton School Committee continues to make critical educational investments in all students, including additional social, emotional, and academic supports for our rapidly increasing population of high-need students who struggle with school. <coughs> It should be noted that six years into the multi-year fiscal stability plan, funding for NPS is 24% or $5,700,492 higher than the FY 2013 funding level, evidence that our commitment to funding our schools has been sustained via the plan. The second largest expenditure increase in FY 2019 is $643,585 for debt service, the annual payments we make on capital funds borrowed to invest in equipment, vehicles, pavement, infrastructure, and city and school facilities. More than half of this increase, $414,500, is due to our debt on the non-debt excluded portion of the police station project. The police station was financed using a hybrid repayment schedule, which kept payments low for the first six years of the bond and then bumped them up in years seven through 20. This was designed to help the city absorb the debt associated with the new police station project during what was then a post-recession, fiscally constrained budget environment. The third largest FY 2019 expenditure increase is our appropriation to Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School which will rise by $506,212 to $8,137,138, with a major portion of that coming from increased out-of-district tuition enrollment. As with NPS, Northampton's local contribution to Smith School will increase 3%. The school budget proposed by Superintendent Lincoln Hoker and approved by the Smith Vote Board of Trustees focuses on continuing to strengthen both the school's expanding academic offerings as well as its award-winning vocational and technical shops. It should be noted that six years into the multi-year fiscal stability plan, funding for SVHS is 44% or $887,646 higher than the FY13 funding level, helping us exceed the state's net school spending requirement. The fourth largest expenditure increase in this proposed FY 2019 budget is for charter school sending tuition, which is estimated to increase by $285,194 to $2,692,089, or an 11.8% increase over this year. Charter schools and the unfair funding formula and mitigation reimbursement history associated with them have been discussed in nearly all of my previous budget messages because of the significant negative impact they have had on our ability to fund our school system. 
The City of Northampton has experienced a net loss of $27,348,286 since charter schools were first introduced 24 years ago and $10,749,856 just in the last five years alone. Say that again, over $10 million just in the last five years alone. The flawed funding mechanism underpinning the charter system assumes that our significant loss of dollars in sending tuition will be somehow offset by the lower costs of having fewer students in the district. Losing 200 students spread across six schools and 13 grade levels, however, does not allow us to reduce our school budget for teachers, support staff, special education, transportation, building maintenance, capital improvements, and utilities by the almost $2.7 million we will be required to pay out to surrounding charter schools in FY 2019. This flawed funding approach is only compounded by the state's failure to fully fund the statutory reimbursement formula that was designed to help mitigate the aforementioned loss of funding to charter schools by local districts. Under that formula, Northampton was entitled to receive $489,532 this fiscal year, according to the DESE website. Because the governor and legislature have consistently failed to fully fund charter school mitigation, Northampton will only receive $285,519, or $204,013 less than called for by statute. Taking cumulatively over the last five years, Northampton has been shorted $873,753 due to the chronic underfunding of the charter mitigation formula. This year's pending state budget includes varying proposals for funding charter school mitigation, but none of the proposed budgets from the governor, 80.5 million, House, 90 million, or Senate, 100 million, provide full funding for a line item that in the current fiscal year is $73.4 million below what is needed to fund the reimbursement formula written into state law. The fifth largest FY 2019 budget increase is our required contribution to the Northampton Retirement System that will go up by $171,515 to $5,826,095. The city's pension assessment is determined by an actuarial funding schedule updated every two years by the Northampton Retirement Board and approved by the state's Public Employer Retirement Administration Commission, or PIRAC. The current funding schedule has our local system reaching full funding in FY 2032. Notable by its absence from the top five budget expenditures list this year is employee health insurance. During my kickoff meeting for the annual budget process with the City Council and School Committee in January, our initial fiscal projections for FY 2019 estimated a 5% increase in our health insurance line item based on guidance we received to plan for a potential 5 to 7% increase pending the outcome of the provider procurement process then underway at the State's Group Insurance Commission, or GIC. An increase in that range would have represented an estimated $550,000 to $750,000 required spending increase in our budget, which would have necessitated drawing even more of the override reserves in our Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund to cover. Fortunately for the city, those early projections did not materialize and the GIC was able to offer renewed health insurance plans with no premium increases or, in the case of even a few plans, slightly lower premiums. As we talk about the progress we've made in stabilizing our budget over the last five years, the importance of our decision to move the city's employees and retirees into the GIC health care program cannot be underestimated. Rather than negotiating with insur insurance providers as a lone municipality with a relatively small pool of employees and retirees, the GIC offers Northampton and other member agencies the negotiating strength of over a half million participants. Providing our employees access to the GIC's menu of quality, affordable health insurance plans has kept city costs down, helped extend our fiscal stability plan, and most importantly, preserved funds for our schools, public works, police, fire, and other essential services. These will be important considerations as we meet with our employees and retirees in the coming months to discuss whether to renew our membership in the GIC for FY 2020 and FY 2021. While I am proposing the use of a relatively small amount of our Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund to cover these and other city and school costs outlined in this budget, 
there are potential new sources of revenue on the horizon that could help us replenish those funds and potentially extend our multi-year plan further. The legalization and pending licensure of adult use marijuana in Massachusetts is one such source of potential new city revenue. Though no licenses can be issued until July at the earliest, earliest Northampton has availed itself of the local option 3% marijuana sales tax and is eligible to seek an additional 3% in host com community mitigation fees from local licensees. I am pleased to report that I recently negotiated our city's first adult use marijuana host community agreement with New England Treatment Access, or NETA, that will pay us the maximum 3% in mitigation fees together with a voluntary annual contribution of $10,000 to city nonprofits to support marijuana education and prevention programs supporting safe, legal, and responsible use. While there is no clear estimate for how much new city revenue will be derived from this emerging industry, it at least offers a promising new source of local funding outside of property taxes and anemic state aid. One other hopeful new source of revenue for cities and towns struggling to fund local budgets is the fair share amendment ballot question anticipated to appear on the November 6, 2018 state election ballot. A yes vote would enact an additional 4% state income tax surcharge on all income over $1 million with <coughs> new revenue to be divided equally between funding for public education and transportation. I strongly support this measure and am proud that my predecessor, former Northampton Mayor Claire Higgins, was one of the original 10 citizen signatories to the constitutional amendment petition that led to getting it on the ballot. Adoption of this so-called millionaire's tax would not only make our current flat income tax more fair and progressive, but it also offers hope for increased Chapter 70 school aid, charter school reimbursement, Chapter 90 aid for road paving, and other critical funding that can allow Northampton to continue investing in our community and sustain our budget stability into the future. The Northampton Charter requires that, quote, the mayor shall submit to the city council a proposed operating budget for all city agencies, which shall include the school department for the ensuing fiscal year with an accompanying budget message and supporting documents, unquote. Obviously, this is a task that no mayor can do alone, and this budget represents a team effort. I want to thank Finance Director Susan Wright for her outstanding work on this and my previous six budgets. Thank you to our city department heads and school superintendents for working to, to develop fiscally responsible budgets for their individual organizations. Thank you as well to my chief of staff, Lynn Simmons, executive assistant, Annie Lesko, and mayoral assistant, Court Klein, for their invaluable contributions toward putting this annual budget document together. I look forward to working with the city council over the next several weeks to answer any questions about this budget or provide additional information it may need. Copies of budget documents are available to re for residents to review at our two libraries and at City Hall, as well as electronically on the city's website. Respectfully submitted, David J. Narkowitz, Mayor of Northampton. Okay. Well, we thank you for submitting that budget message, and we also look forward to beginning the process at our first hearing again on June 6. So thank you very okay. much, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we come now to the consent agenda. It contains the following items. Please let me know if you would want to remove any. Uh, first, under licenses and petitions, approving licenses and petitions uh, for the following. Petition for annual license for a junk dealer for Richard and Sharon Huntley, 254 East Hampton Road. Petition for a second-hand dealer license at Electric Eye Records, 52 Main Street, number 6 Florence. Petition for second-hand dealer license. Lewis M. Farrick Antiques of 5 Market Street. The consent agenda also contains uh, the following appointments uh, for approval by the City Council tonight. They have received a positive recommendation from the Committee on City Services uh, to the Arts Council, Eamon Edge of 56 Summer Street, term April 2018 through June 2019. Uh, Dara Herman Zierlin of 49 Lyman Road for a term of April 2018 through June 2021. Uh, there are two candidates who withdrew their candidacy and so they are not part of this referral. Um, I'm sorry, not referral, but actual uh, vote by the City Council. 
but these are for referral. Uh, the following appointments to committees will be referred to the Committee on City Services, to the Agricultural Commission, Robert Volinger of 460 North Farms Road for a term of July 2018 through June 2021. Board of Health, William Hargraves, 26 Crescent Street, number G1, uh, July 2018 through June 2021. The Council on Aging, <coughs> Cynthia Langley, 419 Fairway Village, Leeds, uh, for the same term. Jean Hoos of 36 South Park Terrace, for the same term. Um, Jean Petty of 63 North Loudville Road in Florence, <coughs> uh, for a term of July 2018 through June 2020. And Kathleen uh, Breeden of 7 Hampton Terrace, for a term of July 2018 through July, excuse me, June 2021. And to the Housing Partnership, Michael Roy of 243 Park Hill Road uh, for a term of July 2018 to June, uh, June 2021. To the Parks and Rec Commission, Glenn Connolly of 49 Platinum Circle in Florence uh, for the same term. To the Public Shade Tree Commission, Jennifer Werner of 16 Winthrop Street uh, for the same term. Molly Hale of 96 Oak Street in Florence for the same term. To the Planning Board, Mark Sullivan of 83 Maynard Road uh, for the same term. Alan Verson of 508 Kennedy Road in Leeds for the same term. And to the Trust Fund Committee, Catherine Foot Newman of 697 Bridge Road uh, for a term of June 2018 through June 2019. Are there any removals from the consent Move agenda? Move to Okay. Um, <coughs> may I just ask, um, if we can remove out for purposes of questions on our discussion, um, one of the, or the, the topic of the junk licenses. Certainly. Uh, so we are removing the first license, uh, the, uh, the junk dealer license for Richard and Sharon Huntley. Not that one, it's okay. Electric Eye, seems okay. to be missing one of the documents. Okay. So that license uh, uh, is removed. Any other removals <coughs> for the consent agenda? Um, it's made and seconded, so all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? The consent agenda is approved. Is there a motion on the question of uh, granting the license for electric eye records? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Um, I just noticed in the documents that we received, um, they all, <clears throat> because the, this is the one area where the city council um, has uh, through our legislation around uh, wage compliance, we had a form that's attached to each of the applications, and I just noticed that that one is missing only for this for this one application. The other two have the certificate of tax good standing and for tax filing, um, as does Electric Eye. It has the tax the certificate of compliance for tax filing, but it seems to be missing the um, wage compliance certificate and. Yeah. I don't know what, I don't know if there's a deadline on this and that's why I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm not objecting to it I just don't know whether we should find out whether mm -hmm. um, whether that document is just missing in the shuffle it's a good good eye um, I don't have that information I'm guessing the mayor does not it might be a question for the city clerk um, yeah. so without that information we could either take action on it tonight we could continue it to our next meeting um, certainly an important thing I'm glad you caught so yeah I'm just a, you know I, I don't want to I don't want to hold up the license if there's a deadline that they have to have it I mean I don't want to be putting them out of business just for a little paperwork here. Um, we could grant oh Councilor Dwight it is possible I don't know this for absolute fact but I believe there is the owner is the only employee so that may be part of mm -hmm. the, okay they maybe thought it didn't apply but I'm not positive that I'm fine with ha with moving so. it through and just looking into that myself just to, you know, and I'll report back. Okay. It sounds likely that we'd be in safe territory with that, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I think it's good that you pointed out, so thank you. Okay. So we have this on the floor. Any other discussion on this question? Um, can do the, well, let's, let's have a, no, we can do this with a voice vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions, <coughs> the license is granted. Um, good, thank you. Uh, now we will recess for finance. Starting Councilor David Murphy. Thank you. John, would you call the roll of finance, please?
Councillor Murphy. I'm here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor LaBarge. Present. Councillor Nash. I'm here. Scare. Okay. Change. Close. <laughs> Thank you. That's you. I'm here. That's but. It. <laughs> well, you were on finance in the last term. Maybe I just got reassigned. <laughs> <laughs> the mystery of council. So at any rate, uh, we got some financial orders tonight. The first one is 18.100, in order to acquire one parcel of land containing 50 acres more or less located on Henhawk Trail in Williamsburg. Order that whereas the city of Northampton owns a surface water drinking supply in the town of Waitley, surrounded by watershed land owned by both the city and private owners, and whereas it is in the interest of the city to acquire privately held parcels within its watershed as they become available for sale to protect its drinking water supply and whereas certain parcels of land within that watershed are available for acquisition and it is in the interest of the city to acquire the parcels for watershed protection. Now therefore it be ordered that the city council authorizes the acquisition by gift purchase eminent domain or otherwise uh, the fee interest in one parcel of land containing 50 acres more or less located on Henhawk Trail in Williamsburg and shown on <coughs> the town of Williamsburg assessors maps as parcel 2B um, and its lot 25.1. This ac acquisition is for the purpose of the sanitary protection of the Ryan and West Waitley Reservoir. It's part of the City of Northampton's water supply. The parcel shall be held in the custody and control of the Department of Public Works. The parcel is held by the estate of Eva Lawrence and is recorded in the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, Book 708, page 337, also in Book 4182, page 348 property is bounded on the east and west by the city of Northampton watershed land and to the north by the Conway State Forest. Most of the parcel is located within the surface water protection zone C of the Rhine Reservoir. A tributary of the Avery Brook runs through the parcel and as a result about nine acres is located within the surface water protection zone A of the Rhine Reservoir. The DPW has secured a drinking water supply protection grant in the amount of $34,063 towards the purchase of the property. The agreed upon purchase price is $126,199 and the balance will be paid from the Water Enterprise Fund. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. 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 Uh, two, I've heard <coughs> All right, and the mayor's here to answer any questions about this. Again, uh, I think the order is pretty self-explanatory. This is one that um, we've been in negotiations with um, property owners since about 2011, I believe. <coughs> and again, it's a it's a key parcel in our in our water supply uh, protection uh, zone C of the Ryan Reservoir, um, and it's again sort of surrounded by conservation land on all sides, um, city conservation land on three sides, and then the Conway State Forest um, on the fourth side. Um, we do have a grant uh, that's going to help subsidize um, some of this. And then, as you know, as part of our capital uh, planning over time, we put um, there's funding for this type of acquisition that when we have the, the opportunity to acquire um, additional watershed parcels, um, this allows us to do it. Um, so now the, the you know, we, we were in final negotiations, we believe, on the sale of these parcels. The other key thing that may not have been in there is that origi the original owner of the property had planned to extensively log the property. Mm -hmm. That had been the intention. Um, so this will, obviously, the land will uh, not be logged and it'll, you know, we'll obviously maintain it, but we will not be, uh, you know, stripping it of lumber because obviously we want that uh, tree stand and that land to help uh, be part of the protection for our watershed. So um, this is really just authorizing us to try to make the acquisition, doesn't authorize any funding. <coughs> the funding already exists uh, through a, a pr pr uh, prior appropriations as well as the possibility of this grant. Questions for the mayor on this? Councillor Labarge. Thanks. Um, so we're paying $126,199 yes. plus we are getting a grant for 34,063 mm -hmm. which we owe the balance would be 92,136 correct yes uh, yeah right. and we're going to be paying that with the water enterprise land fund yes um, we have in the water enterprise fund um, uh, similar to what you do for the conservation commission um, uh, we put aside funding um, a small amount so that when these types of opportunities arise, because um, we sort of have a patchwork of parcels just like we have in our conservation land, 
Um, we tend to have long-term negotiations with property owners about it. And so this gives us the ability to be able to then, when it happens or when we get a grant, to be able to have matching funds to be able to leverage the grant. So we have the funding to do that. My question, Mayor, mm -hmm. if I can recall with Ned Huntley at that time, when he came forth and wanted to buy property, which I didn't support it because of the plans and the way they were designed, which was not adequate. My question is, Ned Huntley said he wanted that land because they also wanted to go ahead, cut trees for logging, and we haven't heard an update at all about has that occurred with that previous property we bought in that area and any kind of money, because he said it would make money. Yeah, we have a, um, you know, we do have an extensive forest management plan, um, and actually, um, timing is good. Next week is Public Works Week, and uh, I put out a, some information today. Um, we're going to be offering tours of various facilities, including a tour of our watershed land. Um, we've been working with a um, with a forester, a forester um, who has been doing, um, uh, you know, cutting in our in our watershed. Uh, to be able to remove, um, you know, species that are affecting the, can the tree canopy or species that are in danger of um, you know, dying and, and falling into the river or into the reservoir, creating erosion. Um, so part of the, one of the things we've been doing on these tours is showing people that effort. So we have been going out to bid um, and doing some, but again, it's not, it's not like full-scale logging, but there is timber that does have a value that we do get um, some value from right. that comes back into a timber management account. I can't quote that for you off the top of my head, but I can get you information. <coughs> yeah. And if you go to our um, to the DPW uh, web page under the water page, you can read um, copies of all those uh, of all those forest uh, management plans um, that we've been working on for the last several years. Uh, you may have recalled the white pines that had to come yes. down. I remember that. Um, uh, because of the, the infestation mm -hmm. uh, that was killing them. So there's been a lot of that work as well. Uh, but we have a great forester. He's, uh, he's uh, you know, um, sort of a leader in sustainable forestry. And so he's being very careful about it, but, but I mean, being very sensitive to our, to our watershed. But we have been doing um, um, some timber removal as part of that larger plan. Any other quail? Councilor Bidwell. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, 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 this patchwork, this assembly over time, it's really interesting to see and visualize. I was wanting it for second reading. Sure. If possible just to see yeah. the latest okay. version of how all these acquisitions have come together. We can do that. I'm a visual person too, so I, I will, um, I'll work I'll, on that with the DPW to get us something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Or we can even just send it out to you between now and second reading. Yeah. Any other questions for the mayor? And can we uh, visualize a positive recommendation? All in favor, please say uh, aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, the next is 18.101. Uh, we're getting into uh, community preservation allocations now. Um, this is an order for uh, conservation area interperspective signage for historic Northampton. Uh, for the Northampton Historic Commission for $100,000. Order that whereas the Northampton Historic Commission has submitted a CPA application for conservation of Priority 1 gravestones at the Bridge Street, West Farms, and Park Street cemeteries, and whereas the Priority Stones were identified through an extensive preservation planning effort and are in imminent danger of being lost forever, and whereas the project has a wide range of community support and will augment ongoing efforts by the Department of Public Works to preserve Northampton's historic cemeteries, which are a significant and important component of the city's historic fabric, and whereas on April 4, 2018, uh, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $100,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $100,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Historic Commission for the Priority Historic Gravestone Conservation Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $98,000 is appropriated from the CPA Historic Preservation Reserve Account and $11,000 is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Reserve Account. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. 
And we have uh, Ms. LaValle here, who is the staff member that deals with the CPA funding. Um, any questions for her from council? Oh, here she comes. So um, there, there's one error in this <coughs> order. Uh, it should read at the beginning, priority historic gravestone restoration for the Northampton historic. Priority historic? Yes. And it's so in at the very top of the order, uh, instead of conservation area interpreter signage. Yes. Any questions for Sarah on the gravestones? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. Aye. And don't go away because we get a bunch of yours okay. coming up. I, I have to show you the fun slides though about the gravestones. We got some slides yes, to see? Get the some gravestones? Slides. Yes. Oh, uh, so <coughs> just um, quick, um, I'm usually here with a lot more funding recommendations. This is the entirety of the CPA funding that is remaining for this fiscal year. Uh, 738,877 was allocated in January to a, a number of great projects, many of which have already gotten started. Um, and then next slide. Uh, so the Greystone Restoration is a cooperative project between the Historical Commission and the DPW. Uh, DPW began several years ago putting together preservation master plans for the three historic cemeteries. And it's continuing work that's already begun to rehabilitate the historic cemeteries through a variety of funding. Um, down on the, the left corner of the slide is the Bates Tomb for which City Council appropriated funding uh, a few meetings ago. Uh, next slide. Uh, Bridge Street was 1661, followed by West Farms in 1788, and Park Street in 1825. Uh, next slide. These are just a few shots of the disrepair of some of the stones. So this will work to address the priority number one stones. Oops, this is the next one. Where is that? Uh, the one on the left, I believe, is West Farms, and the other two are Bridge Street. All right. So we ready for the next one? Yeah? Good. All right, the next is 18102, an order for historic arms storage from <coughs> historic Northampton. Order that whereas historic Northampton has submitted a small grants application for Community Preservation Act funding to purchase climate controlled museum collection storage units to properly uh, and securely and safely display historic firearms. Whereas the firearms collections include significant swords, bayonets, firearms, many of which were produced in Northampton and are connected to past residents and whereas the project is part of an ongoing work by the historic Northampton uh, to make the history of the city more accessible to the residents and visitors and whereas on April 4th, 2018, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $2,976 in Community Preservation Fund funds to be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $2,976 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to Historic Northampton for the Historic Arms Storage Project and the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council, specifically that the $2,976 uh, $2, is appropriated from the CPA Undesignated Fund Reserve Account. Do we have a motion? Second? Second. Uh, and here's a picture and Sarah has some comment, I think. Yes, so this is not, uh, these are not firearms or, or bayonets, but this is a picture of what Historic Northampton has been working on to make the collections more accessible to everybody. The picture on the left is what the collections used to look like. You can see just all sorts of stuff piled up. There's things on the floor. Uh, it's being damaged by humidity, it's not accessible, and then on the right is what they were able to accomplish with CPA and community funds. Questions for Sarah? No. Counselor? <laughs> um, I just, I, I'm wondering, there are certain um, places that we fund regularly with CPA funding, and clearly Historic Northampton is one of them. I'm wondering if at some point it might be possible to see kind of a history of the last, you know, five, six years of how much CPA funding um, the kind of frequent flyers receive. And also I'm kind of curious about where other funding comes from for these, these um, kinds of projects and just understanding where the <coughs> amount that they, the CPA 
contributes where it fits into kind of the bigger picture of the funding that they receive. So I'm wondering if it's possible if you request that kind of information, if you have access to it, if we can have access to sure, it. Sure, absolutely. That, it's part of the grant applications to the extent that the grantees know it at the time they apply, uh, but they always follow up with additional financial information. So that's something I'd be happy to provide either in a follow-up at a council meeting or by email. Thank you. Other questions on this one for Sarah? All right, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 And uh, this next order also has a, an error in it. It says state hospital interpretive signage. It should be conservation area. Should be what? Conservation area interpretive signage. Council Murphy, before we get to that one, we, we didn't actually vote on the uh, cemetery oh, one. On no, I think we got really taken with yeah. Sarah's taken slides. With so, um, yeah, we need to go back and vote on And back to the cemetery. Um, That's 101. All right. Any questions again for Sarah on that one? But we did have the motion. Then, all in favor of a recommendation on 18101, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Then we're on to 18103. Uh, and this is an order for State Hospital Interpretive Signage, and it's from the Office of Planning and Sustainability for $2,900. And where was your correction here again, Sarah? It's not State Hospital. It's exactly that. It, so, yeah, so it's conservation. It should be conservation area. <coughs> so, and uh, State Hospital is the, is the next one. So order that whereas the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a small grants application for the creation of informational signage at uh, permanently protected open spaces around the city and whereas the project will provide historical, cultural and natural resource information about the city's conservation areas and will help encourage, encourage visitation to these open spaces and whereas the project meets goals of both historic preservation and open space and recreation and is supported by the Conservation Commission, whereas on April 4th, 2018, the Northampton Community Prevention, Prevention, Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $2,900 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project, and whereas, if successful, uh, the interpretive signage program will be incorporated into planning for future acquisitions. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $2,900 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to conservation area historic and ecological interpretive signage project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council, specifically the $2,900 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Do we have a motion in finance? Second? Second. All right, so this was another small grant similar to the last one. Um, the idea of this project is to create um, probably eight conservation area signs that are there, that are more than just wayfinding and trailheads, but really telling the stories of conservation areas. Um, this is a map of where we're at with different types of con conservation areas currently. Some of them get a lot of use. Some of them have a lot of public knowledge. Some of them are smaller, and people don't know as much about them. Uh, so the Office of Planning and Sustainability pr submitted an application to um, to put up some signs that really tell the stories of these areas and hopefully increase use. Questions on this one? No, hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Right. Next is 18104, order for State Hospital uh, Interpretive Signage, a State Hospital Memorial Committee for $3,000. And this is the State Hospital. This yes. <laughs> order that whereas the State Hospital Memorial Committee submitted a small grants application for historical interpretive signage at the former State Hospital and whereas the project will help preserve the memory of the Northampton State Hospital and its importance to the history of the city and that many people who lived and worked there and whereas the project has wide community support and was enthusiastically supported by the Northampton Historical Commission whereas on April 4th, 2018, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the State Hospital Interpretive Signage Project and the grantee meets the conditions approved by the 
Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the Council, specifically that the three thousand is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserves. We have a motion to finance. Second. 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 All right, so here is a photo of the state hospital as it used to be. As time goes on, the, this memory is getting lost more and more. Uh, you can see the in the right side of the, the photograph the, the fountain where the Memorial Park will be. The fountain is currently nearly rest restored and will be installed hopefully this construction season. Uh, and as part of the ongoing memorialization work, the committee was hoping to create a walking tour that was designed primarily by students from Smith College. Uh, and we also have Betty Sharp, who is a historian involved in creating the signs. And next slide. Um, this is an example of one sign that is already installed at the burial ground, um, which is the, the Smith Farm Fields and the, the unofficial dog park. Uh, so we're hoping that um, this walking tour will, will let people know what, what the area used to be and how important it was to the city and the region. In favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? And the last one is 18105, an order for theater restoration phase two at the Academy of Music to the amount of $50,000. Order that whereas the Academy of Music submitted a CPA application for continued restoration <coughs> to the historic auditorium, including appropriate architectural lighting and opera box improvements, and whereas the project will come. Uh, will complete renovations to the auditorium that have been in process for several years and will allow the theater to be more fully enjoyed by its visitors and whereas on April 4th 2018 the Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $50,000 in community preservation funds be used to support this project now therefore it be ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Academy of Music uh, for theatric for theater restoration phase two projects specifically auditorium lighting stenciling carpet seating and rails and that the the grantee meets the conditions approved by the community preservation committee the mayor and city council specifically the fifty thousand dollars is appropriated from the cpa budgeted reserve we have a motion in finance make a motion second second uh, <coughs> all right so this is the, the very last stage of the theater restoration at the academy of music uh, as you can see from the photos, they've done a great job, and everybody agrees it's really a gem for the community, but there are a few last pieces left to be done. Um, this picture is taken from one of the opera boxes, but if you've ever attended an event at the Academy, you'll notice they are not in use. Um, they don't meet code. You can sit on the edge and, and tip over. People put drinks on them, and they, they fall on people, so they haven't been able to use those. Uh, the floors are just plywood. There's no carpeting in there, so um, this will allow those improvements to take place. So the they can actually be used during performances. And also in the second picture, you, it's hard to see, but the, the lighting in the back of the academy um, isn't really appropriate for the magnitude of the theater. It's sort of just Home Depot stock fixtures that are stuck in the ceiling. Um, so the academy would like to address that with some more historically appropriate lighting. Um, and this, this will represent the end of the theater. And then they can move on to the next phase. There's a lot more, there's a lot more to be done. Any questions for Sarah about this application? All right, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. And did you want me to stick around for the full council discussion? Yes, no, no? no. I'm seeing no, so I guess you're, you're out of here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I know of no new business. Is anyone else? Then a motion to adjourn would be in order. To adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. <coughs> uh, we're starting out with 18.100 in order to acquire one parcel of land containing 50 acres, more or less, located on Henhock Trail in Williamsburg. Is there a motion to approve this order? Second. Okay. Any discussion on the order? Um, roll call whenever we're ready. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shaw. Yes. Um, the following are uh, Community Preservation Committee projects, 18.101, um, in order for conservation area interpretive signage for the Northampton Historical Commission. Is it okay to take these as a group? I'd like to take them as a group. Okay. Uh, the next would be 18.102, an order for historic arm storage. 
uh, historic Northampton. Well, the first sum is $100,000. This sum is $2,976. 18.103. This is an order for conservation area historical and ecological interpretive signage for the Office of Planning and Sustainability in the amount of $2,900. 18.104. An order for state hospital interpretive signage to the State Hospital Memorial Committee, $3,000. 18.105 in order for Theater Restoration Phase Two Academy Music, $50,000. A motion has been has already been made on the floor as a group. Um, any discussion on any of these? Council Bidwell. Just to, just clear, is, 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 is this going to be two votes? Is this first reading of first of two? This is first reading. Just clear just, to finance. Just, just didn't say so on the agenda. Okay. Wanted be, just wanted to be Good clear. clarification. And Thank one you. other clarification. When it comes back to second reading, the, the titles to these got a little screwed up. And maybe by second reading that can be cleared up. Um, when, when Sarah was here, she correct. pointed out. And I, I corrected the, yeah. is there an, another one besides the 18.103? Uh, 101 as well. 101 as well. Right. Uh, so I misread that as well. And that, the correct That's title of that. Okay. Oh, so that's the priority historic gravestone. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other uh, discussion or comments on this? Uh, okay, we'll have a roll call on these as a group, please. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Uh, those are approved in first reading. Uh, on second reading, 18.094, an order authorizing the mayor to sign a a vendor contract for up to five years. Uh, this is for voting equipment. Um, to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion on this? Okay. Roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Okay. 18.095 in order of Garfield Avenue taking. Is there a motion? Move to move. To approve. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Okay. That is approved as well. So now we're on to ordinances, and it says 18.072, an ordinance relative to parking on Hooker Avenue. This was referred to the Transportation Parking Commission and Legislative Matters. This is on first reading. Is there a motion to pr approve this? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. And um, I'll, I'll just read it. Um, well, let's put the map on the screen whenever we can, because that's the easiest way. Um, and basically what it does is delete all the no parking at certain times from Schedule 2 in Section 312.103 of the Code of Ordinances that currently apply to Hooker Avenue. Um, and if I may, I would like to prevail on the chair of the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, to perhaps explain it to the council. Okay, um, here, let me pull up that map. So the history of this is a little vague, but I think it was sometime around 1987, um, the, there was a um, ban on overnight parking that went in, and um, it was never uh, uh, routinely enforced. And so, uh, and the, the, the thought is that, you know, that some neighbor was bothered by this, by this some overnight parking, got some sort of enforcement that happened and cleared up whatever the matter was, which was probably some nearby business. Um, then over the years, the, the enforcement fell by the wayside. And uh, then uh, over the winter, uh, there was an event uh, that I, my understanding, it involved emergency services, trying to get access the street, and that, um, that the, um, the ordinance was rediscovered and uh, signage was put in. The, the, the faded signs that everyone had come to ignore were now replaced with new signs and enforcement began. And uh, people on Hooker were uh, surprised. And so the request went through uh, to the TPC that uh, that the that the ordinance be changed to allow overnight parking, um, and um, so it. This is the recommendation of both the uh, DPW and the TPC to eliminate 
the ban on overnight parking, and uh, we, we sent this forward with a positive recommendation. Thank you. Um, any comments from the council? Questions? Council Dwight. It's worth noting that this ordinance historically was established before we actually had what's called a snow emergency, established mm -hmm. the rules of a snow emergency, where it doesn't allow overnight parking um, uh, during the snow emergency. So, uh, so this predates that, and I suspect that that's what, what was the precipitating event. And in fact, point of fact, the signs not only faded, they just weren't there. So one day, like a mushroom after the rain, suddenly the signs popped up, and uh, as a result, the neighbors were quite surprised, and the people on the street were distressed by the, the impact that left. So it, I think it's appropriate now, given that we now have systems in place that will uh, prevent, or hopefully prevent, or certainly allow parking enforcement uh, in, in the event of emergencies to allow access for emergency vehicles, which is the biggest concern here. Great. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay. Uh, let's have a roll call on this, please. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay. The ordinance is approved at the first reading. 18.073, an ordinance relative to parking on Vernon Street. Uh, similarly referred um, and also comes with a map. The text of it is simply to add uh, on Vernon Street that parking is prohibited, prohibited at all times on the southeasterly side from Elm Street to Jewett Street. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Council, uh, Council Dwight. Um, you'll note that this came with a neutral recommendation from Legislative Matters, principally concerned about uh, eliminating significant amount of uh, parking capacity on one side of the street. We actually didn't know how many, uh, how many spaces would be eliminated, nor did we really know how the uh, abutting neighborhood felt about the prospect of having one side of the whole, basically the, the, a significant portion of one side of the whole street um, with restricted parking. So um, so okay. we, we left our committee without, without, a, uh, without a positive or negative recommendation. Was there any conversation in the, in the TPC maybe about those issues? So uh, with, the, with the TPC, this, uh, this request was generated by a, uh, a, a neighbor who took advantage of the new uh, 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 signage, uh, parking change request form online. So it, uh, she presented at the TPC, then went home and um, started that process. This, uh, you know, then goes off to uh, DPW, and this was the recommendation that came forward from uh, both Maggie and Donna, and um, and we felt that it was a good plan, and uh, TPC sent it forward with a positive recommendation. I attended uh, legislative matters the other day, and um, and heard the questions raised by um, counselors there. Um, I forwarded in an email after <coughs> that meeting. You know, requesting a little more technical information around um, what these changes mean, and um, I haven't heard back yet. So um, so we have, um, so it, precisely how many spaces are eliminated, I don't know. Uh, what precipitated this was uh, it had to do with uh, snow and ice buildup that um, during the winter months that um, the um, having parking on both sides of the street made it very difficult to to the point of being impassable at points and so that was the request uh, the reason for this request um, one of the things that was talked about in the tpc was if we have any regulations where we create no parking zones during snow during the winter because we have this encroachment problem all of the time all over the city throughout the winter uh, we don't have any um, uh, means of doing that right now, so it becomes an either or of allowing parking or eliminating parking, and so that's yeah. where this stands. Council, um, 
I can uh, s talk to the opinions I've heard from two res residents of Vernon Street. Both of them uh, are supportive of this. They, they can attest, as can I, because I live a block from, from here, that uh, with, with snow conditions and parking on both sides, it's, it is really, really constrained, quite, quite narrow. So I get that. On the other hand, both of them said, it, it, it is a good traffic calming measure. It is a good speed control measure to have parking on both sides. So you've always got that mixed part of it. But on balance, at least two, don't claim that it's representative of everybody on that section of Vernon Street, but at least two folks would support this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of in Ward 3, Phillips Place, similar dynamics. I'm sure there's many examples throughout the city. Um, so my question is, are we just you know, throwing a dart at the dart at a map and, and doing it on this street, when will the other ones come? Not necessarily a reason not to do it, just a question in my mind. Uh, Councilor Murphy hasn't spoken, and then Councilor Dwight. Yeah, I went, actually went down there yesterday, um, and the, the problem in close proximity to the high school is not that people park there, but they park there all day. So uh, weekdays, if it's available, it gets parked up, which does make it very congested when the snow's there. And it's not a snow emergency, emergency overnight thing, but if the street is narrow because of the snow and you have parking on both sides, it is, it is not a very wide street at that point and it's very, I'm sure, very difficult to get through there in the winter. And it's not like the cars come and go. They come at 7.30 in the morning and they stay till three in the afternoon. So if the street gets constricted, it's constricted all day, basically. Council. You know, my concern is, of course, whatever parking you eliminate here manifests somewhere else. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's it's not like it disappears and suddenly. So, some I think to your point, someone else's headache becomes someone else's headache. And Council Murphy could probably attest to this because his proximity to this particular yeah, they're they're going to come in front of my house. Right, the, the street's forty feet wide in front of my house, so it doesn't really affect. Well, passage like it does down well, here. Well, here's, here's the rub, and this is how we've come up against this issue, and this is probably not the place to have this fight, but the fact these these are public streets. These are whoever parks there. If you pay your excise tax and you have a going to car, you have the right to park there. The people who actually uh, who are proximate to that parking space, it is not theirs, although you'll frequently hear people testify. They're parking in front of my house. They're taking my parking space. It's not your parking space. Mm -hmm. um, it, and so if that's the impetus for this, I'm a little concerned. Relative to the constriction issue, have we or has there been a, a test run of emergency vehicles? Now, obviously, now would not be a good time to do it because we're talking about the winter. But when this becomes a problem, what we usually do or what we have in the past when something like this presents itself, we see if an emergency vehicle can navigate this, that street safely. Um, if not, then that that seems to me that's that's enough of an inspiration to to actually impose the kind of restrictions. I'm just basing a guess here based on the pictures of the cars that I see here, and I'm looking at close to 20 parking spaces. That I don't think it's that many. Really? There's all kinds of driveways. Yeah. And okay, so there's yeah. driveways. Okay, no, fair enough. And this maybe it's ten maybe. There's a parking lot. So well, 10 spaces are not are not insignificant, and I think. Um, you know, high school students are just as qualified to park on those streets as anybody else. Uh, this is also a neighborhood that has competitive parking issues with Smith College students as well. Um, these pressures have been ongoing as long as I've been part of this city government. Um, and I think we have to be careful because I think to Council O'Donnell's point, what's the next request? And why? Because if you do it for one street based on a complaint without, without a deeper investigation, then you, you've established precedent, and a precedent that you, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. So that's my concern. Councilor Bidwell. And then. I, 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 I wasn't at the TPC meeting, but, but my understanding is this, 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 this is hardly, um, you know, poorly thought out. I, I believe both the DPW and the analysis that they went through, which I'm sure was based at least in part on, on access for emergency vehicles, and then TPC, which considered it, 
you know, I think it, I think it's I think it's gone through the process. There may be down the road an improved process for a little more systematically dealing with the situation. But in the meantime, we have a situation that uh, has not come because of neighbors not liking car, cars parked in in front of them. It's it's a question of access down the down the street. The other thing I would note is that if it is 10 parking spaces, 12 parking spaces, whatever it is. Um, yes, they will be displaced, but in my experience, they will be displaced to streets, as Council Murphy says, that do have, that are, that are much wider. Uh, Woodlawn can better accommodate parking on both sides, and of course Elm Street can accommodate parking on both sides. So to me, it still, it still makes some sense to, 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 to go along with the recommendation from both DPW and TPC. Councilor Barge and Councilor Murphy. Thank you. I have to agree with Councilor Dwight, and I can recall both him and I, as city councilors, did request to have certain streets to see if the fire department could access a street, which we did ask for that recommendation. And to me, I'd like to know, has that ever been done? Can anybody answer that? because I think that's critical first before jumping into something like this. Councilor Murphy. Um, and, and to Councilor Bidwell's point, um, I've gone down there. I think it's tight. Um, there frankly is adequate parking for the houses there on that side of the street. You can see the parking areas there. So it's not, it's not so much resident parking, it's traversing it. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is you can park on both sides of Elm Street and there's never any cars on the Child's Park side, and I can assure you the, the squirrels really don't care if people park on that side of the road. Uh, it happens from time to time, but those spaces are there, just nobody ever uses them. So there's plenty of place for them to go. It's very tight down there, and it's, I don't think it's even 10 spaces, reasonably speaking, that are gonna be displaced, but it's gonna make the street a lot easier to traverse. But, Councilor. Uh, excuse me, Councilor, so. Uh, I'm sorry. Were you posing a question to Councillor Labarge? No. Okay. Then we're going to go with <laughs> Councillor Dwight next. Um, in the process of the study, it was it, do we have the accident history that was considered um, that was that inspired this and resulted? There were, were there a series of accidents that occurred as a result of people trying to drive down a, a, a street that has been constrained? Um, I, you know because this is not a unique situation if the street has been rendered was rendered imp impassable in the winter not only for emergency vehicles or for any vehicle i can understand why that this would make sense but my concern is all streets particularly secondary and tertiary streets um have snow banks they'll get snow banks in the winter this is something that we can pretty much count on and as a result they become more restrictive uh, i live on a such street that suddenly becomes a one-way street or people trying to figure out how they pull over to accommodate oncoming traffic. I don't want this type of restricted parking on my street, which doesn't make me very popular on my street saying that because there are people who do want it for the very same reason. Where do we stop? Where do we start? I don't know. And again, you know, and this will this will be the ongoing theme of my conversation tonight. Um, Precedent establish, pr establishing this precedent makes it difficult. I would like to see some more compelling information as to accident history and and genuine conflict problems for people trying to pass the street, um, rather than based on someone's feeling uncomfortable. Because I really don't think we should base laws on feelings. So, Councillor Nash hasn't spoken for a while, and then we'll go back to Council Bart. Boy, we like to debate parking. <laughs> so um, we really have lively debate. Um, so uh, Councillor O'Donnell referenced Phillips Place, and Phillips Place actually has this same sort of configuration going on as it comes up from Holly Street to accommodate <coughs> trucks. This isn't a truck escape route, but but there is at the open at the start of Phillips a, a, a similar arrangement. So I, I think you know. Um, the idea of having you know, space so vehicles can enter and leave the street. Um, I understand Councillor Dwight's concern of like, well, what, 
what does that look like? Is there a metric for that? Um, and um, and that I, I think that's the kind of stuff we probably should be looking into. Mm -hmm. um, that um, you know uh, that you know possibly you know what what is the width of the street and where do we see these problems where the snow banks you know if it's you know 18 feet wide we're going to end up with certain problems and maybe we need to have parking on one side of the street uh, if it's 25 feet then problem solved parking on both sides um, and I think we could probably come up with that data but that's not before us tonight it, it's this particular situation um, so that's my comment um, Councilor LaBarge because you were waiting Okay, you were waiting, but we'll go to Councillor Klein. And then I just have a really quick question for the chair of the TPC. Do we have um, information about the criteria that the parking engineer uses? I mean, if we had yeah, a little bit more information yeah. and we knew that there was, in fact, a, a standard by which she's going, it would be helpful. Well, uh, I could seek that out and bring it to a f future mm -hmm. meeting if people would like. Um, that was part of my request. That I was hoping to hear back on. The the only data that I have is that we have is what was presented in the um, the other document here, which is the um, the the recommended ordinance. So that's all we have at this time. Okay. Our our options are voting on this, amending, continuing, sending back to a committee. Just to keep that in mind as we move this towards a vote, and Councilor. White and then Councillor Bigwell. Um, this, this of course, comes up for a second reading, and, and if we can have the information by the second reading, that would obviously be very helpful. And I would recommend uh, the TPC consider something like a winter restriction parking system as opposed to a year-round issue, just for the for the sake of maintaining as much parking inventory, because this is our first world problem in this town: parking, parking, parking. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and, and I think we have to be assiduous when we approach these things because um, there are consequences to ultimately changing and, and particularly in significant amounts uh, parking, uh, parking uh, 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 capacity. So. Councilor Bigwell. Um, I would be comfortable with, with either uh, Proceeding and hoping that we have additional information for second reading or or, or continuing I, uh, And I guess I would ask the chair of the TPC do you do you think we are likely to have answers to the questions you've asked? Yeah, I hope so. Yeah um, Would you would you prefer that we go ahead and Approve and wait for additional information for second. Yeah, reading? I think that would work That would be and I'd just like to remind people, this isn't your typical secondary street because of its proximity to the high school. These cows are, cars are warehoused there for seven hours a day. They show up at 7.30 in the morning, and they sit there all day long. So um, it, it's a little different than your typical secondary street that isn't impacted by a public facility like that. You know, cars are there a long time. I have to say I'm a, I'm a little confused on, on that point, to be fair, because if that's the issue, then we should have limited time parking. Uh, so bringing this to a, a vote at some point. <laughs> well, to which I would add, expanded capacity to provide parking for the high school. And in the absence of that, I don't think we should be punitive in eliminating spaces for high school students. So we prefer to stay in school and not jumping in their cars and moving them every two hours. So. <laughs> All right. Um, are there any other motions other than to proceed to a vote tonight? No? Okay. Then I will ask for a roll call, please. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. No. Councillor Dwight. No. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Barge. No. Okay. Uh, it is approved on first reading by a vote of five to four, and we will see it again. Um, now we move to eighteen point zero eight zero an ordinance limiting the number of retail marijuana establishments in the city. First reading, I will just read the order. Um, uh, and the city council, well, 
2018 upon the recommendation of Councillor Dennis P. Bidwell and Councillor James Nash, an ordinance limiting, uh, limiting the number of retail marijuana establishments in the city, be ordained by the City Council of the city, uh, city of Northampton and the City Council assembles, assembled as follows. Add the following to the Code of Ordinance as section blank. Um, in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 94G, Section 3A2, there shall be no more than 10 retail marijuana establishments in the city of Northampton. This limit shall not apply to marijuana establishments other than those operated by a marijuana retailer, as that term is defined in Mass General Laws, uh, Chapter 94G, Section 1. So motion to approve this ordinance. So moved. Uh, made by Council Bidwell, seconded by Council LaBarge. And I would ask maybe the sponsors to start us off. Discussion? Yep. All right. Um, <coughs> so um, I have a little statement here. Uh, we all have insurance for unforeseen events. The cap sponsored by Councillor Bidwell and myself is about ensuring that this new industry, retail marijuana, will not grow unchecked and change the fabric of our community with, without us having a say in the matter. Our cap is a surge protector against possible unforeseen growth that might impact our community. I want to be clear that Councillor Bidwell and I welcome this um, emergent, emerging retail sector. We want to see it happen. We also don't want it to overrun us. Hence, we are submitting this surge protector, capping the number of marijuana retailers at 10. Um, during legislative matters the other day, we heard some concerns from our colleagues, and I would like to briefly address them now. The question of da data kept being raised. How do we know that capping the number of marijuana retailers will avert some of the concerns expressed by individuals in our pre prevention community, which we heard from <coughs> tonight. The answer is we don't know, and it's not because we haven't been looking for the research. The problem is that retail marijuana is so utterly new that the data is hard to come by. The problem, uh, instead, what you have been hearing from su supporters of uh, our uh, CAP are parallel studies, such as those concerning teens around alcohol and tobacco, where increased exposure leads to increased use. Instead of hard data, we can only provide inference. Sadly, that is all we can offer right now. Our emerging re marijuana retail industry, moving from prohibition to socially accepted, is unpre unprecedented in our lifetimes. We are embarking on a social experiment where we are the subjects. Thankfully, the Commonwealth has provided us with the means to, to determine the size of our Petri dish. So yes, we are lacking data, but our supporters are, supporters are not lacking concern. During legislative matters, we also heard an argument that our proposed cap is unprecedented and that we've never hemmed in a business before. I beg to differ with this view. Our zoning is riddled, riddled with limitations for a multitude of business activities, where you can fix a car, where you can bottle products, where you can raise chickens, and as one property owner recently found out, where you can grow marijuana. It, all of this is regulated within our zoning ordinance. Our zoning um, hems in the, the limits of business, business activities all over the city. It even caps the height heights of our buildings downtown at 70 feet. Concern over changing our city's character is often at the heart of these regulations. Over a decade back, our concern about the possibility of a Walmart superstore led to zoning that capped the allowable size of retail establishments here in Northampton. I supported this effort then and in hindsight now. It was a terrific decision. Today, we have a Walmart that meets our needs, and we have a downtown that was protected by this measure and is the envy of the communities around us. We have heard concerns from a range of respected individuals in our community, our Board of Health, the Office of our District Attorney, our Police Department, and the network of people dedicated 
to preventing drug and alcohol abuse in our community. They see some hard realities coming down the pike as we step into retail marijuana. They believe a cap would help quell some of their concerns. As I close my remarks, I have a request to my colleagues on council today. If you are on the fence and um, leaning one way or the other, I ask that you support our measure today for first reading. This, this will uh, uh, allow our proposal to move forward. It will be reported in the Gazette and we will be able to get feedback for a final vote on second reading. I want to thank my colleagues for considering our CAP pr proposal and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Council for War Two. Sure. <clears throat> I'll start by thanking Councillor Nash for the great deal of thought and effort that he's uh, put into this. Um, a lot of this comes down to do we really think it's necessary that there should be a cap? And I'm not convinced that it's necessary, but it might be. The, the, the problem with this is we just don't know what will happen, but we are starting to get a little better sense. We know a lot more than we did when we started talking about this a month or two ago. I spoke this afternoon with a commercial realtor who has been talking over the months with upwards of 20 um, potential operators that have just been kind of poking around, kicking the tires. But he reports that there are now five of these uh, who are actively involved in putting down money for options for leases on specific properties downtown. And he's aware of two others that are in what he describes as kind of wait and see mode. They're, they're, they're circling. They're waiting to see what happens with the first wave of operators and, and we'll then see uh, how the market is responding and maybe, and maybe come, in, come in later. And I think these are, these are, are real. These aren't, are, aren't all the rumors. These are, these are folks specifically downtown who are uh, moving in the direction of, of leasing space. Yes, there are additional hurdles. They have to have their host agreements in place. They have to have grower contracts in place. They have to go through the state process itself. But uh, they are serious operators with serious intent uh, with on the dire in the direction of control over, over particular downtown spaces. And that's the report from one realtor. So I, I do have a, a little more specific sense than I did at, at one time that we could really wind up in this first wave with five or six or seven retail establishments, probably in downtown. Um, and we could, over in the months to come, in a, in a second wave, uh, have, have another, another couple coming in. So is it likely that we will have eight or nine or ten retail marijuana establishments in the next couple of years? Hard to know. But it does, seem, it does seem plausible. Is it possible that there might be 12 or 13 in three years or something like that? Maybe. Maybe not. But it, it's, there's enough of a possibility for that that for the reasons that Councillor Nash has described, I do think we should take advantage of an opportunity that we have now to put in place this insurance policy. Uh, if we put in place a cap now, we can always raise it. We can always just overrule it. Uh, but it's our one opportunity to do anything. Uh, I, too, would like to talk a little bit about the question of data because I was at Legislative Matters where it was a major understandable topic. We all like to think we're evidence-based in the work that we do. And is there definitive data establishing causality as opposed to just correlation from other states uh, about OUI, about, about arrests for intoxicated driving, for crime, for ER visits, uh, increased youth, youth use of uh, marijuana, traffic accidents? There's data, but it's too early, it's, 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 it's too early to know. And in, and in fact, even if we did have better studies, we'd probably be saying, but yeah, but that's California, that's Colorado, that's Oregon. Uh, our situation is different and every situation is different. So the fact of the matter is that the only good data we're going to have is the data that we have from uh, local experience two or three years down the road. And, and I would argue that 
that we should uh, proceed with caution in the meantime, knowing that we have the option to learn over the next two, three years what has been the real, the real experience, and act accordingly at that time. Uh, and all of these are reasons why uh, the police chief, among others, is very definitely in support of a cap of 10. The other thing that I would say, and we talked about this in legislative matters, I would rather um, be part of, a, of, a, of an effort to put this cap in place now and have people tell me in two or three years, that was, that was silly, it was unnecessary. See, we didn't really need it after all. I would, I would be glad to have people say, I told you so, we didn't need it. Uh, what I wouldn't be as happy about would be to not have a cap in place and in two or three years have uh, public safety and public health situations that have really gotten problematic and uh, a fundamentally changed nature of our downtown that kind of got away from us. I would rather be making the first mistake than the second mistake. So I, I can, I, after all of this, I continue to think there's a, a solid rationale for putting in place a, a cap of 10. Thank you, uh, Councilor Dwight. Um, I was, I was the one in legislative matters making the case about uh, we don't, it wasn't hemmed in, actually, it was capped. We don't cap any other business. And by the way, liquor stores are capped, but not by us. That's by the state. Places that sell tobacco have to be licensed, but you can have as many as you want, and they can be anywhere. Um, fortunately for the community, a number of uh, people who sold tobacco which kills 480,000 people a year, uh, have, to, have made conscientious decisions not to sell tobacco products. Alcohol, um, on the other hand, also kills close to 300,000 people annually as well. Cell phones kill, um, I think, close to 25, yeah, I think what it was, <coughs> distracted driving from cell phones, I think, uh, I forgot what the number was, but it was, it's, it's incredibly high. It's something like uh, nine to 10 people. There's a sense of proportionality. We don't cap any other business. We say you can't build your building too high. We can say you can't have this type of business in this district, but we don't say you can only have a certain amount of businesses. So you're right, and the state does make an allowance for this. The state also should be pointed out, also makes an allowance for not having a cap. When we make laws, it's critical. I think it's really important because I mean, part of the concern here was the message of normalization that we would project to our children who would interpret this for some reason under 10, they wouldn't interpret this as normalization. What I honestly don't even know what the hell that means. And then over 10 would suddenly be normalizing and suddenly they'd be more apt to, to, con to imbibe. The fact is that the numbers are arbitrary, as the sponsors have also said. I mean, uh, there was some calculus involved, but the fact is it's, it's trying, he was trying to accommodate competing interests, which is as a good way to develop law. But you need to respond, <laughs> a law needs to be a response to an actual problem, a problem that can be identified, not one that can be anticipated or, or worried about on some level. Data is, you know, we, we, you know, we discussed um, an ordinance, obviously everyone remembers this, about restricting the use of security cameras by municipally managed security cameras. And, the, and again, the thrust of that was about data. Who had data, what the data was. And it was actually responding to a very real situation that was presenting itself that actually had significant data. This is, I mean, this has been suggested this is new. This is not new. Mar adult consumption of marijuana is not new. Anyone who asserts that is being more than disingenuous. Adult consumption of marijuana and recreational consumption of marijuana is rife and prolific, not only in this community, but throughout the country. The market forces such as they are, there's a, there's a number of limiting f uh, factors already involved in this. The availability of properties to be converted into retail systems, 
the criteria, the hoops that the state has uh, established f to open uh, a, a, a retail marijuana uh, system, the host agreements, which are required by each uh, seller, and a substantial upfront investment that's provable and that they're sustainable, and that they have to meet all sorts of criteria that even liquor store owners don't have to meet. There are very, very strict standards in place. Our cap, as far as I can tell, the impetus and desire to <clears throat> place a cap is to do something, is to accommodate concerns that are genuine. I don't challenge those. And, uh, but the fact is, that's not the best way to make a law. That's not a law that you, that's here, we'll give you this. We don't really know what it does. We don't know its efficacy. We don't know, uh, these are the concerns you expressed. We really don't know if a cap of anything will make a difference one way or another on the concerns that you have. But we're giving you something, this is what we're giving you. I appreciate the desire to accommodate uh, the concerns expressed by citizens by trying to draft something to acknowledge and recognize their concerns. But again, that's not strong enough for me to pass a law with a cap that is unprecedented. We have no other statute that we, as a city, impose on any other business. We don't impose it on cell phone stores. Lord knows I would be perfectly fine with that, I suppose. I don't know. We don't impose it on, and I, and I said this in Legislative Matters, far more deaths and other health issues are directly attributed to the consumption of saturated fats. But we don't put a limitation. We aren't going to say we're concerned that our town will be overrun with coffee shops that will sell us saturated fat food products. That if we did, I would argue that would significantly change the face of the downtown. And then we're trying to actually then, if this ordinance is actually designed to um, maintain a culture or a sense of place that doesn't correspond with some people's vision of what they think Northampton is, this is always the competition we have. This is always the discussion. This goes from every, every other issue that we talk about downtown and who gets to envision or change and modify it. Northampton is not, has not been in stasis. It has changed in its retail economy over the generations that it's existed. And to actually craft this type of zoning, which is unique, and unprecedented is a type of manipulation that has so far not met the criteria that would make me even think about imposing something like this. I don't under, I, I would love to hear that somebody says, yes, you put a cap on things, you've, uh, you've reduced uh, uh, driving accidents associated with the consumption of marijuana by such and such a percent or you've uh, you reduced youth consumption by a significant amount because the cap had impressed upon them. But that's not available. As you said, you're absolutely right. There's essentially legalization has existed in this country for about um, 34 months. So it's hard to accumulate a, a good solid set of data that would actually reflect what the experience is gonna be. This is unprecedented. We're moving some, somewhere further, but I think our reaction um, if there is going to be re a reaction at all, should be a whole lot more circumspect than this. So my, I fully plan on voting no. I am not convinced. Any other comments from the council? Oh, <clears throat> I can say well. Um, I really ap appreciated hearing from everybody at Legislative Matters, and I appreciate the hard work that Councilors Bidwell and Nash have put into um, working with constituents and hearing concerns and trying to, to voice those in a, in a proposal. Um, there's something, though, that is reminiscent. I've been on the council now for, you know, 13 years, and some of us were here then when, you know, we had another very controversial issue with when we, um, there was a proposed adult use zoning, um, which would take anything that was considered pornography um, to be determined by the building commissioner, who would have to review <laughs> the materials. 
but um, though those uh, those establishments would not allow to be any larger than uh, 999 square feet, no larger than 1,000 square feet, unless they were relegated to one particular spot up near the, um, you know, the Walmart parking lot. That was pretty much the only spot that was, if, and there was nothing even available. And it was, um, you know, uh, I just want, it, it's just remind, it's reminiscent of there being a, a um, a deep concern about the content and the product of this particular retail industry. And um, it was a very emotional and very difficult uh, vote and choice, but I did have conversations with a number of the establishments that were downtown um, who objected to the proposed zoning because, as they said, um, I think I spoke with Oh My Sensuality, asked them what they thought, and they said, well, what, what if FACES opens up and we want to go in there? This zoning would not allow for it. In the end, I opposed the zoning. In the end, the zoning did pass, and the store that w everyone was objected to maintained its uh, 999 square feet and went and, and occupied the spot as one counselor, I remember, said, I'm voting for this legislation because I don't want to see a big porn store on the corner of of North Street and King Street. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was the reason. So um, the store did, you know, the zoning did pass, but they decided to keep their product to 999 square feet. And yet the impact is that now, oh my, should faces open up? I mean, there are any other mom and pop you know, sensuality store or something that we find a little more comfortable with the same material, the same retail products, they are not allowed to move over there. And as um, Councillor Dwight pointed out, it also impacted Pleasant Street video um, because of materials that many of, many of the establishments already had. So um, I know it's not the same, but uh, you know, it's not completely apples and oranges. For me, um, I'm, I'm in agreement with Councillor Dwight that, f first of all, what we're, what we're doing with the cap is something that we do with no other retail establishment. <coughs> I've heard many people say that they don't want to see one more t-shirt <coughs> shop or tattoo parlor downtown, but we're not about to start imposing a cap on tattoo parlors or um, t-shirt shops or any other legal retail business that we just find um, th that we don't want. And I understand, and I do understand the public <coughs> safety, public health concerns that have been brought to us. I don't think a cap um, is the right way for us to go to approach this, though. And that's, that's basically my, my thought on this matter. Um, I'd like to provide just some information or at least my opinion on just the facts of this without weighing in substantively this does not look like a zoning law to me correct so this is not zoning right. okay no. so it's it's important to distinguish some of the concepts that have been brought up on both sides that you know you certainly can regulate where certain businesses go or density or things like that but this is would be outside of the zoning code in, in a section to be determined, but presumably not in section 350, the zoning chapter. Um, and this is just a different animal, just a po proposes a cap for the whole city, correct, in every district? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Any other comments? And, and I just might add. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, please. That specific wording was, was, was drafted by the solicitor, Alan Seawall. Got it. Oh, Council Chair. Um, I also appreciate the work that both Councilor Bidwell and uh, Councilor Nash put into this, and the, the historic perspective from um, Councilors Carney and Dwight. I am um, I, I, not sure that I will eventually vote for this, but I, I also respect the request that we not kill it on first reading um, to have a second reading for it. So I will vote yes tonight uh, to enable that potentially. Um, on, on, oh. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for calling on me. Um, on that point, this went to legislative matters. 
And it sounds like that committee did more than review it for its legal character. There was a policy discussion. How many, how much, how many members of the public showed up? It sounds like there's an interest in more debate on it. That's, that's the argument I'm hearing for approving it on first reading, but was there a substantial there, public? There, there were two, the two sponsors and four, four uh, two of whom uh, spoke tonight. Okay. And then there were, um, and the Kim spoke, he, I, that's the first time he spoke, and at least he didn't, sp he wasn't present in legislative matters, but that, yeah, four members. Now, with the caveat, it was even harder to get in here than it is tonight. We, we literally uh, had to climb over <coughs> fences to get in. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disqualify it on the low turnout. Okay. Um, but the, so, but there were four people whom who have spoken on this issue before. Is there a response to the question? Because then we have Councillor Klein, or is it a separate comment? Because otherwise, I'd want to go to Councillor Klein and then back to. Okay, so Councillor Klein, you had your hand up. Um. So I expressed in legislative matters and will express here that I'm really conflicted about this one because as somebody who works in public health prevention, not in uh, drug use prevention, but in interpersonal violence prevention, I do understand um, public health concerns and I do understand the impetus behind kind of public health measures to try and um, look out for the best interests of the public. And, you know, I, I do feel concern about the effects on the developing brain of marijuana and all of that. And at the same time, I, um, I, I feel like I don't see enough direct um, causality or um, correlative kinds of data that tell me that reducing, putting a cap, putting a number mm -hmm. on how many establishments that can sell marijuana will or won't have an effect on whether mm -hmm. or not kids, um, you know, use it in an earlier age. One of the things that we keep being told by the public health folks is um, that the numbers are steadily rising of marijuana use by youth. And that's without legalization being in place. So again, I'm not sure that necessarily having a pot shop or 10 pot shops or 20 pot shops in Northampton is what is going to continue to push that, that increase of use. We just, we don't know what that use is about. One of the things that I've been thinking about too is um, the way in which we do and don't regulate alcohol, um, access to alcohol. So I went online to the city's website and I looked up all of the licenses that we have here in um, Northampton for the use of alcohol. So I have to put on my reading glasses here because it's tiny print. But it was really interesting and it's the first time I became aware of how much alcohol is available in this city and all of the places and ways in which it's accessed. So. Um, annual all alcohol on premise licenses, there are 30 of those. General on premise, um, things like the Garden House at Look Park, Bishop's Lounge, six of those. Um, clubs, including the Northampton Lodge, BPOE, Michael Curtin, BFW Post, etc., four of those. Um, inn holders, such as Autumn Inn, Hotel Northampton, four of those. So, right here we have um, 44. Um, annual licenses for on-premise alcohol access. So that's 44, so that's just the beginning. Bear with me here. Wine and malt access. Um, it's a, a long list of restaurants, 22 of those. So add that to the, mm -hmm. how many did I say, 40 44. something? 44. So we're up to 64. <coughs> Next page. Um, Miscellaneous liquor licenses for things like Brew Practitioners, Smith College Campus Center, three of those. Um, all alcohol package stores, 10 of those. So we have 10 liquor stores in Northampton. Um, wine and malt package stores, seven of those. Those include places like River Valley Market, Mox Chip and Ale, Jim's Variety. So I've lost count at this point, but you see where I'm going with this. Um, the last page is seasonals. 
and we have seven of those, and those include Pines Theater, La Vera Cruzana, Asian Taste, and then something called Converted Licenses, Bistro Le Grac, Garden House at Le Park, Pine Grove, three of those. So we're up to something like 90 liquor licenses. Some of them are on-site establishments where you have to you know, be there, and we're not even talking about that in terms of um, pot consumption, but uh, 10 liquor stores. And so I'm thinking about that prevalence of access that we have, and do we necessarily know that that's why kids are drinking more? I don't think we know that either. What I'm trying to say is that I, again, I'm just, I'm not convinced that this is the, you know, the, that having, um, you know, if it would actually get to more than 10, I don't think on a practical level it necessarily will in this city, but I, I just don't see that that is the huge public health um, danger, threat, that we're being told it is. I personally am not particularly interested in pot. I, I personally actually wouldn't want there to be, you know, tons of pot shops downtown. That doesn't resonate with me. It's not the kind of city I want to live in. But I also feel like it's not necessarily good law to um, put that cap in place. We also have been told, you know, move, proceed with caution. And, um, and then I think I heard tonight somebody say something like, it's our one opportunity to do something about this. I don't think it is. I think that we can open this up. We can allow it to develop in its kind of an organic and natural manner, and we can see how things develop, and we have opportunities moving forward to regulate and legislate if necessary. One of the ways that that has been countered, that thinking has been countered, that I've heard from the public health folks is, that would be much harder to do because people might be in the stage of submitting their applications, and then how would we tell them, you know, after all their planning that we're, we're putting a cap on later. I, I think that kind of thing happens all the time. You know, laws change. Um, zoning changes. I know this isn't a zoning law, but um, I feel, and I really am struggling with this, so it's not, this isn't a no-brainer by any means for me, but I do think that, um, that we should err on the side of being open, looking at kind of the market, how the market develops, and if at a certain point we feel like something is getting out of control, that we address it then. So I'm inclined to vote no with some um, concern. And then I want to throw out one last thing, which is, um, do we have a time limit on this? Does this need to go into place? And I'm looking at the, the co-sponsors <coughs> here. Um, or is this something that we should bring more to public fora? Or is there some other way in which we should be talking about this? Um, but I am inclined to vote no on this. Councilor Bidwell? Um, well, let me uh, s start with uh, the, the last question asked by, by, by Councilor Klein. Unlike the zoning ordinances that we did put in place, uh, uh, according to the solicitor, did have to be in place at a particular time. Uh, this non-zoning ordinance, no, there is no, there, there, there is no time limit. Uh, <clears throat> on, on, on the other hand, if there is to be a, a cap, I think it's important to send that signal out to the market um, that, uh, that there are, at least for some period of time, until the cap is lifted or removed, uh, limited, limited opportunities. And it's, it's related to the comment about <clears throat> this is our opportunity. Well, I, I, I still really do believe that's the case that um, I think by the time we realize it, there is public health data that is concerning or crime data or other public safety data that is, that is, that is concerning, or if there is a growing sense of the character of downtown has changed in a way we never would have thought, I, I think by then it's probably too late. We could, we could, we could, we could put in a cap at that, at that, at that time, but I th and I have not asked the solicitor this question or any other attorney in my qualified answer myself. But I do think there are issues 
uh, if someone has proceed, been proceeding in good faith and investing a great deal of money in, in, in the process of, 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 of applying, and then what would be considered retroactively the door is shut because they've always started the, already started the process, I do think that would be a problem. So I, I do, uh, again, I, I, I come back to the fact <coughs> that I would rather start with a cap knowing we can always amend it, lift it, than to, than to have nothing in place. The, the, I, I wanted to address the comment about um, just what the, you know, the spirit of Councillor Nash's suggestion that if you're wavering um, to, keep it, to keep it alive uh, for, uh, for a second reading would make some sense. I, I agree with that. Not so much for continued debate among us. I'm not sure we're going to say to one another anything terribly different in two weeks than we are now. But I think the point of it was it'll, get, it'll, it'll be out there, presumably, with, 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 some, with some media coverage of what we're talking about tonight. And it'll, it'll live for a second day. And will all of us hear feedback, I would hope, from our, from our constituents once it's gotten a little, more, a little more attention. And I think that feedback would be helpful when we come back for a final vote. I've, I've mentioned this in a newsletter that I put out about three weeks ago. I, I did my best at the pros and cons of a cap and ask for folks to contact me. And just, just for the record, I don't claim that it has any statistical significance whatsoever. But 60% of the folks who responded said, yeah, a cap seems right and a cap of 10. There's nothing ma magic to them, but that does seem about right. Some said that's too much, we need a cap of six. And some said that, there, that no, we don't need any cap at all. But I, 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 th I think if we put it out there, let folks know that we're considering it, listen to the feedback, we'll, we'll have a lot more public feedback about it than we have right now. Oh, Councilor DeBarge, you were next? Yes. Please, yes. <coughs> cap, 10 to a cap, for two to three years, why two to three years? I would like Councillor Bidwell to explain that, why two to three years? Why not a year and see how it works out within a year? But to me, with business people, I'm having a problem <coughs> with this whole cap. I would like to know if there was a hearing at all for the business people here in the city of Northampton and their feelings. And I, I would really like to take this slow and not push this and have more public forums. Business people, they should be invited. Let's, let's hear from them. They're the ones that are helping making our city what it is. And I wanna hear from the business people you could have a meeting, what you did in legislative matters. What about the Chamber of Commerce? Why were they not here? I really would like to see outreach with the business owners on how they feel about putting a cap at 10. I'm very uncomfortable with this. And I really think it's not fair for business people in this city who generate our business and make our city what it is. I'm finding this unfair because we're hearing about the Board of Health, which yes, I could see concerns with them coming to legislative matters. I wanna hear from the business people. Okay. And we're not in a rush with this, mm. so why can we not have that hearing? And now, uh, well, uh, Council Bill, would you wish to that respond? Was that was a, a yeah, question. Let's go right ahead, yeah. Um, no, our proposal is not something that would be in place for two to three years. It's just, it would just be in place. I think you may have heard me say, if in two to three years we discover that we don't need it, we could get rid of it. We could get rid of it in one year. We could get rid of it in five years. We could raise the cap any time we want. The, 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 the ordinance as it, as it exists, it just puts it in place, period. Uh, it could always be amended. It could always be repealed, whether it's in one year or two or three years. So there, 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 there is nothing in here about a, just to be clear, a, a, a two to three year time frame. In terms of outreach, not just to the business community, but to all the different constituency, I, I absolutely would be supportive <coughs> of, of, of uh, soliciting 
that feedback and Councillor Nash's proposal to just keep it alive for a while while we're all out there soliciting comment during this interim period of time would be one way to go. Uh, would there be uh, an opportunity for other other entities out there to, to you mentioned the Chamber of Commerce or whoever else to, to, to do some kind of forum? Perhaps there could be. I, I don't. I don't feel in any in in any rush. Uh, if there's if there's a sentiment that we want to hear more from any partic from any from our own constituents, from the business community, from anybody else, I'm 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 all in favor of that. Councilor Dwayne, I'm extremely uncomfortable with this. We are making a unique, a distinctly unique aspect of law, municipal law. Mm -hmm. We are actually going to dictate competition based on law with no real facts backing it up that actually make it that critical. And, and it, it's also an issue of proportions. The amount of harm that is associated with marijuana relative to all these other things that we allow. And again, I'm not being facetious when I'm talking about saturated fats or consumption of sugars or all those things far exceed the adverse impacts on marijuana. Also, the crime statistics are way skewed, and I can offer you statistics that countermand those pretty easily. But the fact, the more important fact is, I, mean, I also feel uncomfortable about having a special forum by the Chamber of Commerce. What other business has to be subject to review and approval of other businesses? That, that's unprecedented, too. We don't, we don't allow other businesses to sit and say, we want this business, not that business. That would be, I, I, don't, I can't believe the Chamber of Commerce would stand for that. I don't think that, I think that would be wrong. I think the general discussion among the community and their feeling about this, but I also think that the emotional energy that's been invested in this reaction is overblown. It's disproportionate to the adverse effects that marijuana actually has realized, and as I said, this is not new. This is not new. I think I, I said this in legislative matters. I'm not going to ask anyone to step up and say, but we, I know one person in here who's never had marijuana, who's never smoked marijuana. Me. I know. Well, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> the fact that we're pretending that this is some some dark fog that's sitting on the precipice of the city, ready to consume us and make us run rampant through the streets or turn into a dead concert. I, that I would be opposed to. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that, that that's not going to happen. Dead concerts don't. There aren't dead concerts, so it's not. It is. It is. So uh, the reason I'm so emphatic here is because it, well, this is what we do. We approve <coughs> this, the budget, and we make laws. And we damn well better make good laws, not stupid emotional laws. I'm not saying this is a stupid emotional law. I've got to check myself. Oh, no, I wouldn't. I was just saying. <laughs> no, no, no. But no. Didn't take it that way at all. I'm <laughs> saying that it actually is LOL. a very frothy, ambiguous law mm -hmm. that does not offer the, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide sucker for the people who have concerns, and it doesn't actually provide coverage or protection for the community other than possibly is protecting them from additional competitive systems. It doesn't do, one, what the sponsors would like it to do, and more importantly, what it does do is it creates a law that is unprecedented, that establishes precedent. What's the next thing that we start that we can apply this to? What other business or other system, because we have to make this separate chapter in the, in the, in the law book, what other things can this be applied to? This isn't just sort of a like, oh, this sort of, okay, this kind of makes sense. I know people are upset and people are going to respond. But I, I would remember when, um, and this is to Councilor Klein's point, yeah. when we actually, the city petitioned for a home rule petition for expanding liquor licenses for some businesses who felt they got a little cheap. The businesses that had liquor license were outraged. Mm -hmm. They came and yelled at us. Why? Because we were actually <laughs> We we're providing opportunity for competition that they had paid, as they pointed out, a lot of money to avoid that competition. They actually paid uh, whatever the going rate was for their liquor license. I think in one case it was close to $200,000. Exactly. But that's because we, uh, we developed these absurd liquor laws 
coming out of our prohibition with an excess of caution, and we created this system that, of course, I mean, when you hear the, that, that uh, it isn't out of altruism or concern of fairness that liquor, liquor licensees and restaurants don't want to expand the opportunity for liquor licenses because they're protecting state-sanctioned or government-sanctioned monopolies that are allowed to function without challenging competition. It's the way the casinos work. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to be, not, not without some really, really, really compelling reason that we can make a strong case for why this has to be, why we have to make this big, big step. And now we can certainly have, and we will have, lots of community conversations and discussions about the, the, the developing and burgeoning, possibly burgeoning, I don't think it's going to burgeon all that much, but the marijuana industry. It will change the face of, of our retail systems. Um, just as multiple car dealerships change the face of our retail uh, appearance on King Street. Things change. Change is resistant. But at this point, I have not heard, and still have, I haven't heard anything that even approximates good, compelling reason to create a whole new chapter of law that, that we really need this. Not because other communities have done it, not because the state allows it. Where is the need? Where is the proven and real need? And what problems will it correct? I, so I actually would love to see this die now. I would love to see this die in a first round vote at the end. And then we move on and have bigger conversations. But I understand the counselors who would, who would you know, like to see it go further, and I have no objection to that. It's just that I want, I'm not, cons I, I'm objecting because it is bad law. It's not the way to do good law, which we should at least strive for. Okay, um, Councilor Barge, you had your hand up, and then Councilor Shara. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to echo what Councilor Dwight was talking about with the liquor licenses. And if I can recall, who I know the owner is up in Florence, had mentioned about how he had taken a loan for $225,000 and was outraged because we had increased the licensing and it was so much cheaper and he had to pay for that $225,000 loan versus somebody getting it really cheap. I agree, I don't think there's enough of data here to actually say we need that 10 on the level of 10. I agree with you 100%. Uh, I need more data. I need more information. Councilor Shara. Um, I just want to pose a question that I, I certainly can't answer. I'm not sure if any of us can. And uh, acknowledging that I'm not an expert on uh, capitalist economics in any way, but is it possible that there's, um, that a cap could actually have an opposite effect of perhaps what the, the goal is, which is that it will create a sense of scarcity. And people that were maybe going to feel out the market or see whether they wanted to jump into the market will feel like they need to get in under that cap. And will actually, more people will apply, and the cap will be filled to 10, where perhaps it might not be the case if there wasn't a cap. It's just something that occurred to me. Other comments from the council? Ready to proceed to a vote? Just to respond really quickly. Interestingly, I've heard both um, sides of that. People say that with a cap, um, it necessarily will create an underground, more of an underground market. Mm -hmm. But there are also those that say that without a cap, there'll be a glut and um, a lot of the product will end up in the underground market. So again, it's kind of like a lack of clarity about how this particular market will behave. So I don't think we know. <clears throat> um, I might be unique because I've actually dealt with these people <laughs> yeah, um, in my so business uh, looking for uh, places, yeah. You are a dealer, huh? And, uh, yeah, I have, dealt, I have dealt with these folks. Um, and uh, to a one, they're disappointed we don't have a cap because they don't want unlimited competition. So the people who are looking to apply would, would like us to have a cap. But at the same time, uh, most of them are not worried about a cap of 10 because they don't think the economic viability in the marketplace is going to hit 10. 
it's probably 20 percent above realistically what we're going to hit. So um, that, that's the word on the street from them. And we also got to remember that the market is quite adequately supplied at the moment. Um, and those people aren't going away. Um, you know, we, we can truthfully say that marijuana consumption is not a unique thing in Northampton. It happens every day, and the product is being supplied illegally at this point, and it's satisfying the marketplace. So it's not like we're going to be shutting anybody off. And I don't think those people that are independent contractors now are going anywhere because we have four, six, eight retail locations that are licensed. They're not going anywhere. Um, and they will help control the price because they're not going anywhere. So but that's just uh, the word on the street from what I've heard from dealing with the people that are looking to open licensed facilities. I'll throw that out there for consumption. <laughs> so any more puns or? Uh, um, well, it's, I think it's, are we ready to proceed to a vote of, of my mayor. I'll, I'll give you my opinion. Um, um, thank you for the opportunity to debate this. I think it says a lot about us that we take um, this um, new legal industry very seriously enough to debate in the council as much as we have tonight and then previously with zoning. Um, uh, in, in my opinion, um, I'll, I'll vote no because I don't believe the law is necessary. Um, it sort of reminds me of the Vernon, uh, the Vernon Street parking. It's not clear to me why we're doing this. If, if the purpose is to combat youth addiction, um, there doesn't seem to be data there that shows a connection between the number of retail establishments and that. Um, if the goal is to prevent these new businesses from acting badly and prevent them from um, adopting bad business practices and harming the community, well then competition is good because competition makes businesses hone their, their business practices where a casino, for example, it's one campus and they can do whatever they want. And that's, that's the opposite. And that's where the free market is actually a good thing. Um, if the goal is to protect the appearance of, of downtown, um, this is not a necessary ordinance because it doesn't do that. It's not a zoning ordinance. It doesn't do what, say, East Hampton did, which is pass a zoning ordinance regulating density of these things. Um, and so that's, that's my feeling. I think it was good to discuss. Um, and I, I, I join with others in, 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 in opposing it on this particular one, so. Okay. So uh, we'll have a roll call for ready. Okay. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. No. Councillor Dwight. No. Councillor Klein. No. <coughs> Councillor LaBarge. No. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Okay, the ordinance fails by a vote of five to four. Um, now we move to another ordinance. This is 18.098, an ordinance to delete sewer use from Chapter 260 of the code book. Um, I'm sure this would be another major fight for us <coughs> to have here. Um, it simply, as stated, deletes Chapter 260, and it, it adds in place thereof reserved sea sewer use regulations listed on www.northamptonmass.gov. Is there a motion to approve? Motion supports? to approve. Is there a second? Second. Um, discussion on limits? Did someone explain it? Well, I, I, understand, I understand that, well, um, I think as Council Murphy aptly described it as sort of a house cleaning or modernization of, of the way people would access this code. Um, and I understood that there was an express concern that, once again, this, is, this goes back to the newspaper debate is not everyone necessarily has internet access and, and to have it, them directed to a site if they don't have the means to see that site. Uh, beyond going, you can go to the public library, access it by that, but that is a concern. But the same, by the same token, in order to see the ordinance, that it, uh, the, to see it, this lip, listed in a chapter, you would either have to go online or go into the city clerk's office to ask to see the law as well. So it is an improvement, it's an enhancement, it's not ideal, it doesn't, uh, but 
short of ideal, it's actually, it does at least create more access, easier access to, um, to understanding uh, the sewer code. But I'm, I'm puzzled because we're taking a law and it seems like we're transferring it to the executive to make regulations. <coughs> so by what authority are we doing that? Is it a new authority? Do we just a, a, accept a state law that allows us to do that? Are the regulations otherwise identical? I'll admit I haven't looked up the regulations, so. Um, it should be noted that the city solicitor drafted this language and okay. obviously <laughs> approved it. He made, he, 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 and he noted as such that this is his, he's the author of this language, so. Okay. So short of referring to someone else, I don't know who you would, but. Yeah, yeah Councilor Murphy. Oh, just, it, yeah, transfer it to the administrative code and Finance, actually, right. we did it earlier this year. We set water sewer rates as part of that. It just moved from one place <clears throat> to another, and we're just deleting it from where it no longer lives. But does the mayor have the, does the executive have the authority to do that? And if, if so, what's the source well, of the authority? The solicitor seems to think so, because he wants okay. us to delete it. I'm actually, <clears throat> I, I think that's a, a, a worthy question, and, and maybe, <clears throat> Either, either we postpone the vote or we approve it in first reading and hopefully with an information request Is it okay of the to solicitor. postpone? Would there be any objection to doing that? I have no objection. Uh, before we do that, is there an amendment to, to strike the words reserve sea sewer use regulations listed at www. Et cetera? Because that is not a law also. That's just a, that's a safari bookmark. <laughs> that doesn't belong in the code of ordinances. So at a minimum, we should strike that. Um, is that your motion? Sure, I'll make the motion. Uh, I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion on that amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <coughs> Thank you, I'm a purist. Um, so, is, uh, do I hear a motion to continue this the next meeting? So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 No. Uh, it's continued. Any new business today? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All those people say aye. 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 aye.